cool visits from celebrities, and I'm really eager to share with you some of our favorite moments on this week in review. We're talking about John Stamos, Taraji P. Enzen, Brooke Shields, and Chloe Bailey all stop by to give us the scoop on their latest projects. Plus, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary, if you can believe it, of the beloved film The Sandlot with a look back at the conversation with some of the cast about that movie's long-lasting impact. Lots to do, let's get right to it. You might know him as Uncle Jesse from Full House, but these days, John Stamos has quite the full plate. He's gonna be making an appearance on season two of That's My Jam, hosted by Jimmy Fallon. It's a spinoff of The Tonight Show game where they have celebrities come in and compete in a series of music challenges. So John Stamos stopped by our third hour to chat all about it. Well, John Stamos has been entertaining us for decades, from his breakout role as Blackie Parrish on General <laughs> Hospital, and to his longtime collaboration playing alongside the Beach Boys. I love these pictures. This is a "This Is Your Life," I know, I and of I course, <laughs> as, Uncle, <laughs> as of course, as Uncle Jesse in Full House and later Fuller House. Well, as you know, John also recently put his vocal skills to hey. test on Jimmy Fallon's musical game show "That's My Jam," challenged to perform a rendition of YMCA, but. <laughs> Not the one we know. Yeah. I stood in Uber with Tim Chalamet. Not the actor, just some guy from LA. We ain't buffalo wings. They're just boxy old boy. Uncle Moose is the best place for it. I stood in Uber with Tim Chalamet. Not the actor, just some guy from LA. Now I'm never going to get that version. I know. Here we go. We've been singing around the house. My beautiful wife's here, and she was singing it. She's been, we just kept singing it. The other night, she's singing it in bed. I'm like, don't <laughs> sing about Tim Chalamet. And <laughs> well, that's, that's that right. puts a damper on things, even, doesn't it? Hey, Al. <laughs> yes, sir. You are a superhuman. God bless you, and I'm so oh. glad you're well and doing great. Yes, well, and I don't know what you do, but I, we got to get into it. Right well, <laughs> well, I'm very fortunate. I got a supportive family and supportive friends. So wow. yeah, that, so that certainly helped. So, so what was it like going head to head with all these other folks? <laughs> On, on That's My Jam. Cause, I mean, because Taraji P. Henson came to play with She's you. She's great, but yeah. she was my teammate, which right. was good. Um, I'm not good at uh, doing stuff on the fly. I've, okay. I've done musicals, and, but I like to practice. I like yeah. to rehearse. Uh, and uh, so it, it takes a while. But, but um, my son, who hates watching me on TV, <laughs> I thought, well, he probably will like this. Yes. And he's watching, watching, he goes, you're cheating. You cheated, Dad. <laughs> No, I didn't. How, how did you cheat? cheat? Yeah, what is this whole thing, well, you and Taraji? This, I'm calling it she cheat cheated, but, um, <laughs> No, well, he thought I was cheating because, well, there was a thing with a horn and bup, 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 and I was kind of singing the lyrics, but we won. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 It's all about it. It's all about it. I love it. I uh, couldn't help but notice, you know, you and Jimmy rocking the beard. Um, oh, yeah. And then on The Tonight Show, you and Jimmy not rocking the beard. Right. So who's copying who He's at this point? He's copying me, for oh, okay. sure. Okay. That's a snap on beard, him. His wasn't. Oh. Mine was real. On, just I don't think right he can. On. Yeah, he can't yeah. grow hair. You are. <laughs> he can't grow hair. You have one of the most highly anticipated memoirs uh, coming out later this year, as, as I read. And the title, I want to make sure I get this title right. It's, it's you've. The title is If You Would Have Told Me. That's going to be, the, there's a cover right there. You would have told me that I would be on the Today Show with all of you. <laughs> all right, yeah. right. But seriously, and your book was beautiful. I, I just started reading it, but Isn't the, you? the journey that you, you took with your father, and he's still around and sober yeah. and everything good. Uh, yes, he What is. a beautiful uh, ending. Th mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading the book, too. But did you find, I found the process during the pandemic to be among Terrible. the most, no, <laughs> yes, no. and cathartic, though. Cathartic, 100%. Did you find it to be oh, the same? Yeah. Yes, yes. I, it took me a few months to get into it. I never wanted to write a book. I never thought, first of all, I wasn't interesting enough. I didn't want to tell stories that, you know, I shouldn't be telling, which I haven't. But then um, I was a father, and that moved me into something I've always wanted. And then my friend Bob died, and yeah. so I thought, Absolutely. you know, I, 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 and he's sort of a through line to the whole book, and, um, you know, it's a tragic thing. How but, much do you yeah. miss him? <laughs> it pretty much, a lot, you know, a lot. I, I would, he'd be watching me this morning, he'd say, you're not talking about me enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's complaining up in heaven somewhere. Like, uh, he was, you know, one of my dearest friends and a, a beautiful man. But he never left anything off the table. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, he always said, I love you, I'm proud of you, you know. And so that's a good lesson, yeah. I think. You know, tomorrow's never promised. One of the greatest yeah. huggers ever. He's a good hugger, yeah. <laughs> Can't wait to, can't, cannot wait to read your book. When's it come out, by the way? October. October. You're going to so come back and talk about it? For sure. Yes, I'd love to. Is there going to be an audio version? Do we get to hear it? Of course, yeah. Oh. Did you, you, did you, I was starting to read yours, yeah. That was harder than writing the book. Uh, did you yeah, cry, right? And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's emotional. It, the whole thing is, is very emotional. Yeah. Uh, it's oh, but it's going to be um, a great gift to your son. 
Yes, he's, uh, you know, he's the light of our life now, and it's, uh, it's something I've he's always five. wanted. He's going to be five next week. Oh, my goodness. He's going to be five. I'm going to be 60, and he's, you know. <laughs> wow. um, so he just gets me young. Just gets better. He keeps better. me young. Yeah, right? Yeah, really does. John, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, John. John. Thank you all very much. That sounds like a great time. Always great to hear from John Stamos, who just looks incredible. Makes me mad. Coming up next, we're catching up with the star of the new Peacock original, Chloe Bailey. She's in Praise This, a drama about a musical superstar forced to join a struggling praise team headed to a national competition. Chloe gave us the scoop. Take a look. The lovely, the multi-talented Chloe Bailey. The five-time <laughs> Grammy nominee. She's so busy right now. Her debut solo album, In Pieces, is out just now. She's also starring in Peacock's new movie. It's called Praise This. And we're so happy to have you with us, Chloe. Lots to talk about, lots to sing about. You're going to perform for us in a moment. Yes. But first, tell me about the new album. It's uh -huh. just out. How does it feel to have it I don't know, out in the universe? Man, it feels amazing. I haven't felt as content as I do right now. Mm -hmm. I got everything that I needed to say off of my chest and I'm just filled with complete gratitude. Mm. I'm so excited to be singing in pieces, which is the title track for the album, because we all have those moments where it's hard to pick our own selves up off the floor mm. and we need those around us to help us. So that's what this song's about and mm. I'm so excited to perform. Well, it's all you. I mean, you produced it, you've arranged it. Like this is every, this is like your heart and soul. Literally. Why was this the right time, do you think, for this, for this album to come out? I feel like no matter how much I try to plan things, God always has a better plan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from Swarm then to mm -hmm. my album and mm -hmm. then Praise This and then Tour, it's like I couldn't have come up with a better plan. Uh -huh. And everything happens in its right timing. Mm. Amen to that. Uh -huh. Let's talk about Praise This. Yes. It's on Peacock, a new movie. Tell us about it. Yes, so I play a girl named Sam. She is a struggling musician uh -huh. who is willing to do anything but and whatever to make it. Time. And so her dad forces her to live with her extended family in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and she ends up finding herself with the Praise, Days, Praise Team competition. So I love that. You know, we, I feel like we've watched you and your sister grow up. I remember when you performed here in our studio for one of the first times, mm. you had the love of Beyonce and her mom and her family. And I remembered thinking to myself, my gosh, these two are going to be powerhouses. And it's turned out that way. Your Thank sister, you. of course, is the Little Mermaid. You've got all these projects. Um, just tell us about what this ride has been like for you and your sister. This ride has <laughs> been even more than what I could have imagined and yeah. expected. And I know little Chloe is so proud of the Chloe right now. <laughs> I would dance around in my bedroom, pretend like I was giving concerts. <laughs> I remember when we were here last time, yeah. Sis and I, I was on the grand, we were singing Fall, and <laughs> now I'm here on my own. So it's like we're both growing so strong together and individually, Oof. and I couldn't be more proud of her. Uh, wow. She's Beautiful. probably watching right now, uh -huh. proud as well. That. You can catch Praise This starting today on Peacock. When we come back, don't miss our good friend Taraji P. Henson. Everybody, welcome back to Pop Star Plus. You know, it's always a blast when the great Taraji P. Henson swings by our studio. Whether she's acting, running a business, writing a book, she's always got a cool project up her sleeve. So she paid us a visit to Studio 1A to let us know what she's been up to. 
We are catching up with one of our favorites, Taraji P. Henson, taking home a Golden Globe Award and earning an Emmy nomination for her role as Cookie Lime in the hit series Empire. She's also been nominated for an Academy Award for her performance in Benjamin Button. Well, now Taraji is focusing on a project that is near and dear to her heart. It is called the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation. So good. The foundation is trying to improve access to mental health care for the black community. And Taraji is here with us with an amazing announcement. Taraji, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. This has been such a deal. You've changed a good deal. You've changed so many lives through it. But for people who may not be familiar with the foundation, how did it get started? It got started out of my own necessity and searching for um, therapy for myself and my son and looking for someone culturally competent was uh, a, a task. A challenge, yeah. yeah, it was uh, quite a challenge. And, you know, I'm privileged. I can afford $350 a pop, but what about the community that can't? Mm -hmm. And just the um, the stigma that surrounded around mental illness in the black and brown community, and I just felt inclined to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I started the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation. And, and then you're going to even reach out changing more lives because you got a partnership with Kate, with Kate Spade. Yes. Uh, your foundation is teaming up to do something, uh, uh, She Cares Pod. Mm. Yes. Uh, that's going to take place on HBCU campuses. Talk oh, about that. Cool. So these pods are there um, to, again, you know, every day we're trying to eradicate the stigma. So the more we talk about it, the more people feel free enough to express how they are feeling. Mm -hmm. And so we are putting these pods on HBCU wow. campuses and we're offering um, free mental therapy um, mm -hmm. for, uh, it's virtual, we'll have live sessions as well. You have yoga, we have all oh, kinds wow. of, it's, cool. yeah, yeah, and you got to think about it. I, when I was in college, we didn't have anything like this. So if I knew someone suffering, I wouldn't even know where to tell them sure. to go. So this is a spot where people can exactly. go. Exactly. Safe space. There are rest space. pods, um, rest pods. If you just need to decompress, wow. um, they have classes, yoga classes, um, art, dance. Wow. Um, teach psycho um, therapy to students, and just make them more aware and mm -hmm. being comfortable with talking and expressing how they are that. feeling mentally. What well, you mentioned, if you were in college, you went to an HBCU. You, you went did. to you graduated Howard from Howard University, University yeah. and I, I, was, I was wondering, <laughs> I was thinking about, I mean, think back to that time for you. How would your life have been different mm. if you had had this at your disposal back then? It would have been, I mean, I know a lot of students wouldn't have dropped out. Do you know that 60% of the dropout um, students that drop out are because of mental health problems? Six zero. Wow. Six zero. And 50% wow. of that 60% did not have access to mental health mm. resources. So we're giving hassle-free mental health resources on campuses. We're the students it is needed. Yeah. It is. It's a great concept. Yeah. It's a great Thank idea. You. Um, I understand you also went on a trip yourself uh, recently to, to Bali. Mm. I did. How, how was that? I it, read that it was life-changing. It was life changing. I'm a better person because of it. Yeah, there it is. Um, yeah, I was it like an wall. Eat, Pray, Love journey? It definitely was an Eat, Pray, Love. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I, I I chose to go by myself because I wanted to stay wow. present. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have new oh, you conversations. Went by yourself. Yes, and I met new people. I had this beautiful community that we still keep in touch. Oh. And it was just life changing oh. for me. I, I tapped into a joy and a happiness that I lost. For Ooh, some time. that's so good. Yeah. I was just telling you, we had John Samuels on. Was that just this week that yeah. John Samuels was here? Yeah. Uh, she Monday. was his partner Monday. on NBC's yeah. That's My Jam. Tell me about <laughs> that experience. People are loving this show. It's so much You fun. guys were fun. Yeah, the <laughs> only part I don't approve of is the water. The water. Oh. What was you know, the you, surprise splash? What was that? Well, if you, if the other team gets oh. the lyrics right, oh. then you get oh. splashed. Oh. Oh. And oh. I, oh. Stop it. You can never be prepared <laughs> for that water coming at do you they, like did, that. Did anybody know about black women in hand? Tell him the last time I was on the show, I was like, you can't be squatting women, black women, when you turn into chia pets. I said, I Oh, that was good. Hey, I, I hear Taraji. Is it true that, that that episode of That's My Jam got you your current role on, on Abbott Elementary? It sure did because wow. I'm such a fan of the show. Uh, and I told Quentin how proud of her I was. And I was like, if you ever need, you know, I love you that. on the show, just call me. And she did. And so, wait, there that's am. amazing. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> yes, exactly. The squeaky wheel always gets there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Taraji, thank you for coming in. And congratulations, for congratulations on the announcement. Yeah. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, most importantly, the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation and Kate Spade will launch their first She Cares pod at Alabama State okay. University, oh. a public HBCU that's in Montgomery, Alabama, on April 14th. You were just doing Thank the Lord's you. work. Yeah, I right. have to. My father said if you are blessed, you have to be a blessing. Amen. 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 Honestly, one of our faves, Taraji. Uh, love you. Always doing cool things. Great to have her here at Today. 
Now on to another powerhouse rising to fame through modeling and classic films like Pretty Baby and Alice, Sweet Alice. We're talking about the one and only Brooke Shields, who has graced magazine covers and screens for more than 40 years now. There's a new documentary called Pretty Baby Brooke Shields Chronicles Her Life and how she harnessed her internal power and she navigated her career. Brooke joined Hoda and Jenna to chat about it. You just didn't go anywhere that somebody wouldn't know Brooke Shields. The most photographed woman in the world. Iconic American beauty. Object of desire. A sexualized child model. Exploitation. Vulnerable. I was on the cover of Time magazine as the face of that whole era. Who decides that? She was catapulted into the world of adult sexuality. I just always remember thinking, like, I hope she's okay. She was a young girl in an all-adult world. I'm amazed that I survived any of it. Oh All right. my gosh. We've been talking about this documentary. We've, we've been waiting for you to come here. We're oh. so happy that you're here. But what you just said at the end of the clip struck both Jenna and I that you're amazed you survived this. Yeah, the word That survive. statement is so heavy and weighty. What did you mean by that? And, and thrive, too. Yeah. I mean, when, when you see what I was... Um, put up against from the time I was quite young. And you see it, you can see it in my face too. Yeah. I start to just disassociate. Yes, you could tell. I just, and that, I was protecting myself without even knowing what I was doing. What it was did just you have to so survive? Much. Like what were the things? Just scrutiny and vitriol and anger and pitchforks and blame and hatred to my mother and, you know, and it was like all of this stuff, I was always on my, on the defensive, always. Yeah. Defend your mother, protect your mother. Um, you know, you know, just no, no, no. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm really a good girl. I'm really a nice girl. Yeah. I'm, a, you know, and it was just like <gasps> trying to oh. convince people. I yeah. feel like. Yeah, and also, you know, I mean, I, I've got to watch this. Hoda mm -hmm. and I both mm -hmm. did, and we were astounded. I was astounded by the fact that also people came to you thinking they knew you. Mm -hmm. Like we yeah. got to see all of these interviews with mainly men in the documentary that would say, "But you're this way," mm -hmm. and it was like you weren't allowed to be. Nuance. Yeah. You weren't allowed to be you. Yeah, you had to be one, either sexy or a virgin no. right. or this or that. I mean, there's one that doesn't make it into the documentary, but there is this woman who asked me the same question repeatedly. And I finally, you see me, I must be 13, and I say, I'm so sorry, ma'am, but I don't think you want my answer because I keep answering it and I don't have any other truth. And, you know, you look at that and you think, okay, that was a kid that was searching for her own truth. Well, and I also think a kid searching for her own voice. I yes. felt like you were seeking it. And as a kid, often we're pleasers. Are they happy? Are they happy? Is the interviewer happy? Is the person sitting next to me happy? Are my parents happy? Yeah. Are your parents the, happy? We but do how, it. As women, we really do it. How yeah. long did it take? And do you remember when that you decided, like, this is me? Like, when you feel that settling inside you. I, I think it's been at times different parts. Yeah. Like going to university mm -hmm. was huge for me because mm -hmm. it, it, I didn't know that I could think, you know, I didn't know that I could have an opinion about something that, you know, the way I regarded a piece of literature was my own opinion, you know? And so that was the first thing and that sort of happened. Like, I have a, I'm smart. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I learned that, yeah. And then, and then after that, it was um, basically suddenly Susan and Broadway because those were the things that I found my talent on my own terms. Mm. Yeah. And about That's so good. much more than just looks. Totally. There was something else in it, and I just, I like bloomed from that. So yeah, that was, and then, you know, you're having families and yeah. kids, yes. and you sort of, I think you keep realizing more about yourself. Yeah. The yeah, looks part is was it was actually really hard to sort of swallow because you were told from the time you were a baby and you are beautiful that you were this one thing. You actually say in the documentary you wouldn't even look at yourself yeah. in the mirror. Yeah. In fact, I would take dance class and fall all the time because you're supposed to spot. You're supposed to look mm. at yourself, and I would just. What did you see when you looked? I. I didn't even know what I saw. I just, I just knew I wasn't going to see what other people saw. Mm. Oh. So it was like, oh, I'm going to be disappointed. So they'd say, yeah. well, do you like your hair and makeup? And I'd be like, yeah, it's great. Looks so, perfect. That's Let's good. move that's on. Good. I'm not, you know, that's arrogant. That's uh -huh. self. That's ego. That's. But it's also because you heard from everybody, you're this one thing, right? Yeah. And you're and a you're... pretty baby. You're a beautiful yeah. girl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were more, much more I mean, than my that. My mother called me a piece of art. Like yeah. really, you know, <laughs> you know, but she believed it. Yeah. Now, that, I think that, your mom, that's an interesting topic, because I think a lot of people would expect you to say, how could you have done that to me, mom? How did you put me through that? But you, that was not your mantra at all. 
Was there any part of you, or is there any part of you, as you reflect now as a mom yourself, like, was that the right thing? Oh, absolutely. But as a mother, I look at it. Yeah. Do you yeah. know? But as a daughter, I was so busy trying to keep her alive and protect her against the world. And and she was an alcoholic. So there's that 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 really, you know, and that people pleasing piece. So mm -hmm. I was in that role with her, you know? And she was so broken. Yeah. And even as a child, I had like not pity in the bad in a bad way, but like respectful pity if there is yeah. such yeah. a thing. Like so you were worried about I her. I was just like, oh, what a shame! Like you, this is you have demons, and you don't, and I don't want you to. So I kind of was just like, she thought she was doing a, the right thing. You yeah. know, a lot of her decisions I would have not made, right. well, I wouldn't make today for my girls, but I wasn't a mother then. Wow, it looks like a really cool documentary there, and our best as always to the great Brooke Shields. Coming up after the break, we're revisiting a conversation with the stars of The Sandlot 30 years later. My goodness, stay with us. And thanks for sticking with us. It is Popstar Plus. So 30 years ago today, The Sandlot hit theaters. It's the beloved story of a kid's baseball team in the summer of 1962, navigating friendships and first crushes and, of course, all the many challenges of growing up. The coming-of-age film reminds a lot of us about our own childhood summers and has remained a fan favorite for more than 30 years since it debuted in 1993. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz caught up with the cast back in 2018. And in honor of the film's anniversary, take a look. It's been 25 years since the kids of the Sandlot spent the summer in their own little baseball kingdom. They never kept score. They never even really stopped playing the game. The square, Betty! Get the square! And 25 summers later, the guys from the Sandlot are back together. But there were only eight of them. They didn't have a whole team. So even though I wasn't in the Sandlot, I figured I could be the ninth man and just go sit in the outfield somewhere and ask them how things have been going. It's been crazy. I mean, it definitely gets you in places for, for free. <laughs> <laughs> Can't walk through a Las Vegas casino without someone yelling, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wait, you're yeah, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, you mean that's the same guy? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, has aged better than the rest of us. But there they were, Scotty Smalls, Danunez, Timmy Timmons, Tommy Repeat, Bertram, Squints, and Ham. You're killing me, Smalls! Even the narrator, who is also the writer and director, David Mickey Evans. The only one missing, Benny the Jet Rodriguez. We gotta get Mike, we gotta do the documentary. Yeah. It's called Finding Benny. Finding <laughs> Benny. Yeah, come on, Mike. Mike. And stick your glove out in the air. I'll take care of it. 
Unlike the movie, none went on to play for the Dodgers, but over the last couple decades, that ragtag team has found itself honored by some of baseball's greatest. The Great Bambino! Is it wild to know that a lot of these MLB superstars grew up watching The Sandlot and grew up wanting to play exactly like you guys? I think it's awesome. That's the truth. They made a big impact on a lot of people's lives. And it's not just baseball stars who are Sandlot struck. This is Kevin Durant's Twitter picture. I am Kevin Durant. It's a little known fact. And uh, I'll ball you up. But when it comes to inspiring their own kids. I showed him the movie for the first time. And uh, he's really big on Moana. Squints didn't marry Wendy Peppercorn. So but life's good, and he's got a teenager. I think she thinks I'm just a kind of a dork, so. <laughs> <laughs> but for my generation, the Sandlot defined the summer. The film was made with the same amount of love that people have for it, and it was the greatest summer of our lives. What was your favorite scene? When the treehouse blew up, that was my big moment. The scene I did where they lift me over the fence and I come face to face with the dog. It was pretty neat having stunt guys, though. Right? I did my own stunts in the film. <laughs> <laughs> and these days, with Yeah Yeah looking more like Hercules, you gotta wonder, can these guys still play? I don't believe it. Some a little rusty. Sorry. All right, let's see. <laughs> Sorry. It wasn't a sandlot, but we're old men, and LA City College had some grass. Hurry up, batter. It's gonna be a short game, and I gotta get home for lunch. Here we go, big NBC exec up to the plate. Come on, big boy. Hold on, look at how he's choking up. <laughs> That's I'm a choke nervous. Up. Don't be a goofus. All right, come on. <laughs> Boom! The Nunez is on the plate. Timmy Timmons on first base. Oh, boy. You better start stealing bases, oh, no, man. Uh-oh, look at it. <laughs> Stole that one. Finally up to bat, the Sultan of Smack Talk, the king of calling it out. Oh! You got it! <laughs> I'm not even gonna run. I'm not even gonna run. And as we all rounded home. Seeing these guys, some of them I haven't seen in 25 years, but it is just like we're back. The great Hambino reminding us heroes get remembered. All your heart can. Never go wrong. But legends never die. I can't believe it's been 30 years since the Sandlots released that interview you just saw with Gotti. That was when their anniversary was their 25th. What a classic. We'll be right back right after this. That is all we've got for you today. We hope you enjoyed uh, the little recap we put together of our week. Thanks, as always, so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week right here on Popstar Plus. Have a good one. Spring has sprung. You're cordially invited to join me, 
Elizabeth High School for an outdoor brunch in my hometown, Oxford, Mississippi. Honey, I've catered many brunches over the years, and let me tell you, I've learned a trick or two, and I'm gonna share them with you. From creating an event that's simple yet elevated, to building a menu that's easily plated. Pouring simple sips that will leave you feeling just fine. You don't have to go overboard to have a good time. These tips will make planning oh so fast and will have you making memories that will last. So let's get to it. We've got a lot to do. Welcome to Mississippi. We're so excited to have you. I love planning parties. And the beginning is when all of your creative juices are flowing. And this is one of my favorite ways to kind of rein everything in and start to really get a path that this party is gonna take. Whether you're a first time hostess or someone that caters parties all the time, I'm telling you, the key is to keep it simple. Because if you keep it simple, there's less stress, your cost is gonna be lower, and that means it's gonna be three times the fun. I'm gonna start pulling things that really resonate with me. I've decided that I really wanna have this brunch on the porch. In the South, we absolutely love our porches. And so that's why I've decided to go ahead and have a big long table on the front and that's where we're gonna have brunch. It's been a while since we've all gathered together. I think everyone's kind of been, you know, hibernating in their homes during winter. The idea of them all sitting around this wonderful long table, I think it's gonna be really magical. I normally gravitate towards pink. I have beautiful pink plates, I have pink napkins, but I've used them before. So I am gonna go in a different colorway. So we have lots of blue. So I really think that I'm gonna go with blue. It's the color of the sky. It's like a robin egg blue. To me, it just, it screams fresh and bright and fun. I love the combination of spring green and blue. There are a lot of ways that we can bring these colors in and that may be with the glassware or maybe it's with the plates, maybe it's with the napkins. I love flowers and these hydrangeas are really speaking to me. On our porch, we even had a little nest um, that had tiny baby birds in it last year and, and I really haven't been able to get over that. Maybe we can work birds into this some way. Nothing screams brunch like eggs. We need to think of something that's gonna hold that maybe even that we could reheat like a um, like a frittata or, oh, I know, I know. Yes, we'll do a quiche and then we can cook that ahead of time and then it reheats beautifully. I like to do something that is a little bit heartier, you know, maybe even with a pastry. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay, the sausage pinwheels. Let's think about those. So if we have the quiche, as my mom always said, well, what are you gonna have that's green on the plate? And I wanna remember that. So I'm gonna put this green here. Asparagus are in season right now, so that might be kind of fun. I feel like the salad is gonna look better on the plate. And then the dressing that's left over, we're gonna make that into a guest gift. So we can add that into something, maybe a baby mason jar with a lid and then put that Maybe at the door when they leave. No, 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 because then they're gonna forget it and nobody's gonna remember it. Oh, okay, no, I think what we'll do is we're gonna put that on the table. Yes, honey, we are getting ready. We are almost there. Then we need to think about dessert and spring is strawberries. And I'm thinking I'm just gonna buy a pound cake. We're gonna cheat that and that's okay. Sometimes we need a little break. Oh, a sweet twist on the classic. Okay, I'm glad I cut that one out because that reminds me. We need to think about a cocktail. Um, honestly, I'm kind of tired of mimosas. I love them, don't get me wrong, but I want to do something that's a little bit unusual and fresh. Yes, so lemons. So we'll do lemons instead of oranges, and we're going to do my lemon sparkler. Still, we're going to get those bubbles, that same festive feel, but just a little different takes. OK, I'm really loving the way that this is looking. I think our menu is perfect. Lots that we can do ahead of time. We've committed to the blue and the spring green. So now that we've got this, another way that I get inspired is going to the fabric store. You can get a great deal on remnant fabric pieces and then I'll use that for the table runner. That way you're not committed to spending a lot of money on a tablecloth that you may only use once. This one seems a little bit too busy to me. Um, and then of course we love the birds. So I really do think that this is gonna be it. 
I absolutely love this. I just don't think that there's anything more spring-like than this runner. We're gonna come up with a schedule, and that will include everything from shopping to cooking, and then those final touches, the day of the party. We've drawn out our inspiration, and now we have a plan. So let's get to work. We've selected our runner, and we know it's gonna be the focal point. We need to make sure that it's pressed and ready to go. Once those are pressed, then we can pull out all of our plates, all of our glassware, and go ahead and find a spot in your home that you can leave all of this ready to go on the morning of the brunch. This is the perfect time to pull out those things that are special to you. For me, that's my silver strawberry baskets and colorful glasses. For things that you don't actually own, you can always borrow them from a friend. We know we're gonna give our vinaigrette as our guest gift. And this is the time when we have to decide what are we gonna put that in? Let's go ahead and get those things ordered and ready. This is also the time to go ahead and make your cook list. A cook list is a perfect way to manage your time in the kitchen. I'm gonna put the sausage pen wheels at the beginning and then it will lead all the way up to the day of the brunch. This is the point in time when you can go ahead and pull your vases out, get them washed and make sure that they're ready for the flowers. But listen, don't think that you have to break the bank when dealing with flowers. The secret to making a store-bought bouquet amazing is to cut it open and then use individual flowers and group them according to their color. These little vases are also perfect because you don't have to do a lot to them. Just a few buds and you're finished. And coming up next, we're gonna work on our menu. chosen a menu that is super simple. We're gonna start with sausage pinwheels, and then we have a beautiful quiche Lorraine, as well as a simple green salad with my versatile vinaigrette. And don't forget the pound cake with a little bourbon whipped cream and fresh spring strawberries. You know, you have to remember the whole goal of this brunch is to try to do as much as possible ahead of time. So we're gonna go ahead and start with the sausage pinwheels. We're gonna go ahead and put the puff pastry on our cutting board. So we just wanna flour our puff pastry just a little bit, just so that it doesn't stick to the roller. And I'm even gonna put a little bit of flour on my rolling pin. So we're gonna roll this out until it's just about the size of our rolling pin. And that's gonna be perfect. And now we're gonna take our sausage. So this is just breakfast sausage. It's not been cooked. And you know, I'm sorry, hands, are sometimes your best tool. And what you wanna do is just get a thin layer and it needs to be even so that when we do get ready to roll this, we don't have any spots that are too thick. So you wanna make sure that you're leaving a border. Really about an inch all the way around will be perfect. So now we're gonna sprinkle our cheese on top and then a few green onions. Just a sprinkle is really about all you need. So we're gonna roll this up on the longest side. And what you wanna do is kinda of roll and press. Roll and press. You wanna make sure that you're evenly rolling this. And then I'll just kind of smoosh these ends down here. And now, as you can see, we have our little seam here. Just take your fingers and press it. 
And so now we'll just wrap it in plastic wrap and stick it in the refrigerator. It's gonna chill overnight. And then right before our guests arrive tomorrow morning, we're gonna pull it out, we'll slice it, cook it, and everyone is going to love it. We're gonna go ahead and start on the quiche Lorraine. So we're gonna start with a purchased pie crust. And I'm not embarrassed about it or ashamed to admit it. We've got a lot of things to do to get ready for this party. And this is just a little time saver. We do want to flour our pie crust. So just give it a nice sprinkle. And then I'm also gonna sprinkle my rolling pin. And then we just want to roll it out a bit. And so we will take our crust. We're going to place it into our dish. So now you can see we have plenty of extra dough that's spilling over the side so that we can make a gorgeous ruffled edge. And you want to make sure that you fold these edges under, not only because it's going to be pretty, but also because it's going to cook evenly. And now if you'll take your two fingers and almost make a little V, and then you take your thumb here. And that's it. Look, look at how easy. I mean, have you, oh my Lord, look at that. So it's very simple. It takes a little bit of time, but it's really gonna make the difference in the way this final quiche looks. And your guests will never guess that this crust was store-bought. But these are the little details that will make all the difference in this amazing brunch. And now we're gonna go ahead and add our bacon. Just know that with quiche, it's almost like a blank canvas. You know, there's hardly anything that you can't put in here that wouldn't be delicious. So if bacon is not your thing, I feel very sorry for you. Feel free to maybe add spinach or tomatoes. And now we'll add our cheese. And now it's time for the filling. We're just gonna crack one egg, and then we're gonna add our flour. So this recipe is a little bit different because we do add flour to the egg and whisk it very, very well. It helps to stabilize the custard, making it super light and very fluffy. So now that this is mixed, we can go ahead and add the rest of our eggs. So we wanna mix this very, very well. And now we're gonna go ahead and season this. So we're gonna add a pinch of cayenne and one half teaspoon of salt. And you know, normally we would say salt and pepper to taste. You really don't want to taste raw eggs. So that's why we're being really precise on this. And also eggs really need to be seasoned well. And now that's been mixed in. And we're gonna add our cream. And there we are. Just a little cream. <laughs> I mean, you know, there is nothing wrong with a little cheese, bacon, butter, and cream. <laughs> and so now, we are going to use a whole nutmeg. If you don't have whole nutmeg or can't find it, you can certainly use the nutmeg that's already ground. But I do have to tell you, it's worth the effort. This step is pretty important in the final product and the way that it tastes. And now this is completely mixed in. We're gonna pour it right over our cheese and bacon mixture. We're gonna just mix up the bacon and the cheese a little bit. So we have 10 friends coming tomorrow and I decided to go ahead and make two quiches just to make sure that everybody has enough. And then this is gonna go into a 350 degree oven until it's completely cooked. The great news is about a quiche is that it doesn't mind being reheated. The quality will be the exact same. The taste will be the exact same. What you're looking for is a beautiful golden crust, but then you have to make sure that the middle is set. You can even take a knife and insert it, and if it comes out clean, then you know you are ready to pull these quiches out. So we're gonna put these on the board to cool, and once they've cooled completely, we're gonna cover them before we put them in the refrigerator. And then tomorrow, before our guests arrive, we'll just have to reheat them. So now the quiche is done and it's in the refrigerator. So we can go ahead and make our vinaigrette. 
Obviously, we don't want to dress the salad this early because it would be a soggy mess, but we can make this vinaigrette ahead of time. So we're gonna start with apple cider vinegar. And there aren't many ingredients to this vinaigrette, but each one of them is very important. Now we will add our honey, and that's really gonna kind of offset the tartness of the apple cider vinegar. And then we have our garlic, and then Dijon. Most vinaigrette recipes that you see have the addition of some type of mustard. So we have two things that do not love each other. We have oil and we have vinegar. And I kind of consider the Dijon sort of a, it's like the marriage counselor between two people that don't get along. It's really gonna help bind the ingredients to make a smooth, velvety vinaigrette. Now we're gonna season with our pepper and then we have our salt. Now, I do wanna give this a nice whisk. Make sure that this is thoroughly mixed and then we're gonna add our olive oil. You wanna make sure that you slowly drizzle the oil. Because we have so few ingredients in a vinaigrette, the technique really is important. This does take a minute and you have to be patient, but this really will ensure that our vinaigrette is gonna be velvety and smooth and not broken. You know, I love to give a guest gift. And since I was making this vinaigrette anyway, it was a no brainer. So we just doubled the recipe and now we're gonna fill these little jars, tie them with a blue ribbon, of course, since that's the theme that we're working with for this spring brunch. I mean, are these not adorable? So now these are all done and ready for our guests. It's just a little way of letting them know that you're thankful that they came. And you know, when you get invited somewhere, your first question should be, well, what can I bring? As a guest, you also want to bring your hostess a gift. And I will tell you that one of my favorite things to bring to a hostess is maybe cinnamon rolls or muffins. I know that the hostess has been incredibly busy getting ready for the day, and it would be nice to have something for them to enjoy the next morning. So that's it for the savory part of this brunch. And next, we're moving on to dessert and drinks, my favorite part. And now it's time for my favorite part, dessert. We're making a pound cake with bourbon whipped cream and macerated strawberries. We're gonna start with the whipped cream. A chilled bowl really is the secret to making sure that your whipped cream whips up beautifully and fluffy. So we have our chilled bowl. We're gonna add our heavy cream. And then we have powdered sugar. And now we'll add our vanilla and then we're gonna use a hand mixer. 
So we're gonna start slow and then gradually take the speed up. So as if heavy cream and sugar aren't enough, we're gonna add a little bit of bourbon to this. Just put a little bit in the whipped cream, a little bit in our mouth. Mmm, God, oh, that's good. We're gonna whip just a little bit more. We really want to whip it till it's just a little bit under stiff peaks because we're going to put this in the refrigerator and let it chill overnight. And then tomorrow, after the guests arrive and we're about to serve dessert, we'll pull it out of the refrigerator. We're going to give it a good whisk and re-fluff it. So now we're going to cover it and put it in the refrigerator until tomorrow. So now that the whipped cream is finished and in the refrigerator, we're going to go ahead and start on our berries. I just think that there's hardly anything more perfect in spring than strawberries. And this is one of the easiest ways to prepare strawberries. We're just gonna remove the tops of the strawberries, add them to our bowl, and then we want to bring in our sugar. So we're just gonna give this a nice dusting of sugar. So you wanna make sure that you mix this well and that the sugar is evenly distributed over the strawberries. That way it's gonna make a really beautiful syrup that's gonna be fabulous when we get ready to top this pound cake. Okay, that looks beautiful. We'll go ahead and cover it. So the good news about these strawberries is that they really need to sit overnight in order to create that wonderful syrup, which works perfectly for our stress-free brunch because we can do it ahead. So now we've got these covered and they're gonna go in the refrigerator. We're dusting this store-bought pound cake with a little bit of powdered sugar, and that's gonna make it look even more homemade. We're trying to eliminate any steps for tomorrow, so I'm gonna go ahead and slice the pound cake. Now, I don't want it to dry out, so all I'm gonna do is make these slices and then cover the cake, as well as the cake stand, and then tomorrow, all we have to do is take it off the stand and put it on the plate. That's so easy. And now we'll use our clear wrap to wrap the entire cake stand. And then we can put this aside and it's done until tomorrow. And now comes the fun part when we get to test our cocktail recipe. So this lemon sparkler is in my cookbook, Come On Over, and it's super simple. One of the things that you wanna remember when making a cocktail for a party is that you really need to test it a day or two before, just to make sure that you have your measurements precise. There's nothing wrong with a little taste testing. So we're gonna start with lemon sorbet. And I love these melon ballers for this because you get just the right amount in the bottom of the glass. Now we're gonna add the limoncello. The key to a really good cocktail is making sure that your measurements are precise. So that's why we're gonna use a jigger for this. And now we'll top with champagne. Not everyone cares for alcohol, and when planning a party, you need to consider all of your guests and their needs. So we will leave one of these that we'll make into a mocktail. So instead of champagne, we're just gonna do a lemon seltzer that will be lovely. And the garnishes, they're really one way to elevate a simple cocktail like this. I love to finish it with a little bit of mint and maybe even a little lemon twist. And now for the very best part, the taste test. Oh honey, that is absolutely perfect. Now that the menu's complete and the big day's almost here, we'll be back with a few finishing touches.
the day is finally here. And I'm so excited to welcome my guest. We've done most everything ahead of time, so this isn't gonna be stressful. So let's go get the pinwheels. Now we just have to unroll them and then slice them. And then we take these and put them on our sheet pan. Once we finish these, we will brush it with an egg wash, which will help it to brown really evenly. And we'll go straight into our oven. So these will go in first since they're gonna take longer. The quiches aren't gonna take very long to reheat. So now we'll go ahead and get our quiches out and get those reheated. We wanna make sure that we really cover them well before they go in the oven. Otherwise, they're gonna continue to brown and that is not what we want. Now we'll go ahead and pull our beautiful salad together when you're dressing a salad. It's like the toothpaste in a tube. Once it's out, you cannot put it back in. So we're gonna start slowly. Now, the taste test. It's absolutely perfect. You wanna always be able to taste the lettuce. We have beautiful spring greens and everybody wants to taste them. Now that the salad is made, we can go ahead and get our whipped cream. We wanna fluff it up a little bit. Do you see how the peaks are just falling over? That's the exact consistency that we want. These have got to stay chilled until right before we serve. We'll go ahead and pull our strawberries out. They've been sitting overnight. And so what we want to do is give them a nice stir. Oh, y'all, that syrup. Oh, there's the doorbell. That must be Annie. Hey, Annie, Hi. how are you? Good. Oh, it's so good to see you. And what'd you bring me? Muffins. Oh, my Lord, I'm so excited. I asked her to come over and help with a few last minute details. So now it's just the flowers and we are done. Perfect. Didn't these turn out cute? I love them. Oh, it's just looking so pretty. I just love it. It's party time, and I'm so excited. Hello. Hello. Oh, wow. You're my first guest. Oh, oh my gosh. It's so, so good exciting. to see Hello. you. Thank you for having us. Once your guests arrive, all you have to do is pull them out of the oven. And so we'll just top with a little bit of fresh basil and that adds that pretty green. Does that not make all the difference? Okay guys, come on, let's sit down. Come on out and take a seat anywhere that you like. This is, this is gorgeous. Look, your flowers are beautiful. Y'all got lucky. So here we are, I hope y'all are hungry. This is my versatile vinaigrette recipe. We did them in these little jars for y'all to take home so you'll have a little keepsake. Oh, oh that's, that's so sweet. sweet. Isn't that yes. sweet? And here is our quiche. Lucia, would you like me to serve you? That's really good. You know, I just feel like we've all been kind of, you know, huddled in our homes during winter and now that the weather's nice, I just wanted to get all my friends together. I've been missing y'all. Dude, who would you want to have brunch with? You could pick anybody. You. Me. Oh. Oh. That was cute. Sweet. I know. Okay, so I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready for dessert. So beautiful strawberries and bourbon whipped cream. Those look so good. Mm -hmm. I don't have the last time I had pound cake. This is so good. Yeah, I know. It's delicious. And there's nothing wrong with a little bourbon in your whipped cream. <laughs> I can't thank you all enough for coming. I am so grateful that y'all all came today to celebrate and to enjoy this wonderful spring brunch. You know, having a brunch doesn't have to be stressful. It can be easy and super fun, especially if you do things ahead, have a plan, and stick to it. Cheers, everyone! Cheers! Cheers.
Well, good morning, guys. Welcome to The Boost. Did you know that April is National Poetry Month? So we are going to introduce you to a few poets who've inspired us over the years. But we will begin with a very special conversation with Grammy-winning performance poet Jay Ivey. Al Roker sat down with him to talk about the power of that art and his lasting collaborations with hip-hop legends. It is an extended conversation that you'll only see right here on The Boost. Take a look. If I'm on the highest cliff, on the highest riff, and you slipped off the side and clinched on your life in my grip, I would never, ever let you down. That's Jay Ivey with the poem Never Let Me Down at a recent show at New York's City Winery. In 2004, the poem was featured on a track with Kanye West and Jay-Z for the album The College Dropout. They discovered Jay Ivey after his rousing performances on HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam, like this poem about his late father. Dear Dad, these words are being written and spoken because my heart and soul feel broken. You do a poem about your dad, yeah. which was a, a complicated relationship. Tell me about that. He was in my life when I was younger. He saw drugs and alcohol become a factor in his life and our lives, which you know led to the fights, led to the separation, led to the divorce. After the divorce, Jay didn't see his dad for 10 years. But soon after reconnecting, his father passed away, sending Jay into a years-long bout with depression. But it was poetry that healed him. I decided to write my father this letter, this poem. And I wrote, wrote this poem. There were tears on the page when I wrote it. But when I finished, the, that weight that I've been carrying for years, that depression, that anxiety, all of it just, it just lifted off of me. Now, two decades later, he's being celebrated as a Grammy Award-winning poet. The first poet to win a Grammy in the brand new Best Spoken Word Poetry Album category for his 2022 album, The Poet Who Sat By The Door. This is for the poets, y'all! Historically, there was a spoken word category, but it included poetry, audiobooks, narration, storytelling, any recordings without music. And audiobooks dominated sure. the spoken word category. Meanwhile, spoken word artists are like, uh, what, what about, about us? <laughs> <laughs> After spending six years advocating for his fellow poets, Jay submitted a proposal to the Academy's Board of Trustees, and they voted to create the new poetry category. I said, well, man, I want to throw my name in the hat. <laughs> Let me work on an album. Back in high school, I had a teacher named Azar. What I learned is you're not going to argue with somebody named Azar. In the first track on the album, he tells the story of how he got introduced to poetry by his high school English teacher, Ms. Argue. Ms. Argue? Ms. Argue. <laughs> That's a great And uh, what I learned is you're not going to argue with somebody <laughs> named Ms. Argue. Man, first time on stage, as terrified as I was, I received a standing ovation. And in that moment, my life change. He continues to collaborate with hip-hop and R&B artists, reuniting with an old friend, John Legend, on a new single called Running. The pair first met back in 2004 during his recording session with Kanye. At that time, Legend still went by his family name, John Stevens. I was like, man, you sound like one of the legends. I was like, you a legend, you a legend. Matter of fact, I said, I'm going to call you from now on. I'm going to call you the legend. So I started calling him John the Legend, John Legend. So that's how he got the name, John Legend. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, right place, right time. Wow. Jay Ivey has great pride for his south side of Chicago roots, often visiting schools there to speak with students, going back to the source of his own journey with poetry and serving as a role model for the next generation of poets. Poets hold the soul of our stories. They are the messengers of hope and reason. Street reporters who take notes for the future, who tell it like it is and how it should be. The words of the poet heals the wounds of our spirits, brings balance, breaks through the chaos, speaks life. That's why the world needs more poets. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Up next, an author and poet with millions of followers who hang on his every inspirational word. Take a look. If you've ever scrolled on social media, you may have already come across the words of young Pueblo. Diego Perez is the poet behind the pen name, inspiring readers with wisdom like, 
realize how short the walk is from gratitude to happiness, and manage your reactions but do not suppress your emotions. Since he first began sharing his words of wisdom in 2014, Young Pueblo has connected with over 2 million followers and has written two New York Times best-selling books of poetry on topics like self-love, growth, and relationships. When you first started posting your writing, what was your intent? I wanted to write about healing being possible. Just hopefully inspire someone else out there who also needed to find a way to heal themselves. Diego and his family emigrated from Ecuador to Boston, Massachusetts when he was four years old. My mom, she worked cleaning houses. My dad worked at a supermarket. So we were really stuck in a poverty trap. And then I think a lot of that tension just got embedded inside of me as well. When I got to college, I could not deal with any tension that was coming up inside of me. I would quickly try to hide it with, with um, drugs, with smoking, with uh, going to more parties. What was the breaking point for you? It was right after college. This time I pushed my body to the edge and I took, you know, um, an assortment of different drugs. I felt like my heart was going to explode. I ended up talking to a doctor after that episode and she told me it's a, what I described to her sounded like a mild heart attack. How has being first generation American affect your overall outlook of life, especially in that the first thought is my parents. I saw the immense sacrifice that they made to just give us the chance at a better opportunity. I felt like I was giving all of that up by just filling myself with more and more pleasure just so that I could run away from my pain. I knew that the only way out was to start telling myself the truth. In 2011, Diego started taking small steps toward building positive habits. These improvements eventually led him to daily meditation. So the meditation has given me a way to process these like really tough emotions. And when something challenging happens, I notice that I can feel my reaction, but it's not as overwhelming as it used to be. And meditation gave you the clarity and creativity to write and share. Definitely. I mean, I was never creative before meditating. You know, and I, I didn't go into meditating to become more creative. When the mind becomes lighter and it's not as burdened by past hurt that you carry, um, this creativity bubbles up. Diego's poems have been liked and shared thousands of times. And in his newest book titled Lighter, Diego shares his own journey and advice on how to achieve personal transformation. What do you hope is the biggest takeaway for people who come to you and look to your words? I hope they take away inspiration. It's really possible to transform your life. It's really possible to sort of take that big leap forward in your own evolution. Coming up, we're going to dip into the Today Show vault to revisit some of the stories of some of our favorite poets coming up after the break. Boost. 
You know the name Amanda Gorman, but did you know one of the very first interviews she ever did was right here on Today? Jenna Bush Hager sat down with Gorman in 2018 after she was named the first Youth Poet Laureate in the United States. Since I'm the first one, I get to set a precedent. What do I really want to see in the poetic realm in the United States? Yawning wide as the Pacific tide. Amanda Gorman is the first ever Youth Poet Laureate in the U.S. What is it like to be a first? It's intimidating. And I never really thought that I would be that person who's the first, because I remember when I was little reading about people, it doesn't get past me that not only am I the first youth poet laureate, but at the same time, I'm the first woman youth poet laureate and the first black youth poet laureate. 19-year-old Amanda was awarded the prestigious title last April at Gracie Mansion in New York City. A lot of your poetry focuses on social change, social justice. Where does that passion come from? Mm, I think that passion comes from my heritage, comes from this place where like, I must write, I must speak up, because there's been too many people who've been kept from that opportunity. Who inspired you growing up? Oh, my mother. <laughs> my <laughs> Amanda grew up in Los Angeles, and she attributes a lot of her success to her mom, Joan Wicks, a teacher who raised her and her twin sister as a single mother. Amanda's passion for poetry started in the third grade. Talk to me about when you first knew you loved poetry? Um, I was around seven or eight years old and my teacher Shelly had us reading um, Ray Bradbury's Dandelion Wine. I was like, oh my goodness, Bradbury just related candy to something completely different. That's what I want to do with my life. That's who I want to be. I love that it was a metaphor. You were a yes. third grader with uh -huh. a metaphor and that's all the you needed. The metaphor hit home. It was like magic. Poetry has definitely been one of the most stable expressions for me of my identity and who I am. I love whenever I'm writing to have just all these books of people I look up to beside me. What I really like to do is choose like one word from each of like a collection of books I have, make like a word cloud and select them to make a new poem. But public speaking didn't come naturally. Heal our past and will always be our future. It took courage, determination, and grit for Amanda to get on stage. You've spoken about having a speech impediment. And do you feel like in some ways that led you to poetry? Oh, a hundred percent. And a lot of times I talk about having a speech impediment and the difficulty of literally speaking up for myself. The voice I'm hearing aloud can't pronounce ours, it can't pronounce shh. It's kind of sounds a bit garbled, but I hear this strong, self-assured voice when I'm reading this, you know, simple text. And what that told me is the power of your inner voice over that which people might hear through their ears. The only thing that could impede me was myself. Now a sophomore at Harvard, Amanda started One Pen, One Page, an organization inspiring other young writers to share their voices. So in a world that I think needs light constantly, in a world where social change is being talked about a lot. Where does poetry come in? Poetry is at the forefront of that, from the Declaration of Independence to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream have speech. A dream. Poetry has always been the thread that is weaving throughout kind of the fabric of American and global history. I straddle black girls' tango between northern the heights. The blood of my pen against the cool flesh of my journal. What is breaking through, breaking boundaries? What does that mean to you? I think Breaking through, especially in this day and age, is not only breaking through the door, but it's holding it open so that other people can come through. Will we write an American lyric? We are just beginning to tell. Focus on your path, focus on your purpose, and how you, specifically and specially as yourself, can break through a barrier. From one history-making poet to another, Perry Smith sat down with Joy Harjo to learn how she shares the old story of America with a new voice. In a darkened room in downtown Tulsa, a woman wails through a saxophone solo. Then, riffs through some word jazz. White man felt important and powerful. Joy Harjo is not shy about self-expression and is rarely at a loss for words. The phone rings one day and the 
Library of Congress says, you're the new poet laureate, and you thought what? Lightning went through me. First thing is like, what a responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Harjo is the first Native American to be named poet laureate of the United States. She says it's like being an ambassador for poetry, and in her case, a voice for the seldom heard. You know, this is the power of poetry. It's brought all of us here. What an opportunity, a doorway for Native people. We've been so disappeared in the story of American poetry, American history, and yet we're the, the root of what it means to be an American. Harjo has written award-winning volumes on what it means to come from those roots, words often raw and deeply revealing. When I performed and somebody does a really long introduction with all of these things I've done, one time I got up and said, well, my list of failures is much longer. <laughs> you would roll out the door. Does that end up enhancing what you then do in terms of art? Of course, because there were times where I was suicidal. What could potentially destroy my mind, my heart, was actually good building material. <laughs> Her most recent book, An American Sunrise, connects us to the horrors of the forced removal of Native Americans from their homelands in the Deep South. Would you read a couple okay. of these poems? Um, this one right okay. here. Okay. In Sunday school, we were told Lot's wife looked back and turned to salt. But her family wasn't leaving paradise. We loved our trees and waters and the creatures and earths and skies in that beloved place. Those beings were our companions, even as they fed us, cared for us. If I turn to salt, it will be of petrified tears from the footsteps of my relatives as they walked west. Yeah, we've got a lot of stories. Harjo is well known in Oklahoma. Her Muscogee roots run deep. Here she mentors and tutors young students. It's really awesome to be around her. She's my role model. Like I aspire to be something like her one day. She cool? Yes. <laughs> really? Yes. She is generous, a sharer of extraordinary gifts. This new title, Poet Laureate of the United States, fits. Poetry holds so much that we go to them at times of grief, at times of joy, at times of transformation. You'll always find poetry. You can hold it in your heart. You can hold it in your hands. Harry Smith, Tulsa. Just ahead, how one young poet caught the attention of Oprah Winfrey. Stay with us.
Welcome back. We are celebrating National Poetry Month here on The Boost. Next, meet the young poet with an inspiring story of passion and perseverance and a mission that caught the attention of Oprah Winfrey. Poetry will come to mind. Growing up in Kansas City, Missouri, Marjay Neal suffered a childhood of abuse and homelessness. I had two sisters and we were very poor. There were times where we did not have food for ourselves. The moment that we got evicted and we ultimately had to go to the homeless shelter was one of the darkest times. I knew that life wouldn't be the same after this. While living in the shelter, Marjay's mother insisted she attend an art workshop put on by Halo, a nonprofit that provides housing and education to thousands of at-risk children around the world. She came to Halo pretty quiet and reserved and very much on guard. She was very angry. She didn't know how to express the things that she had been through. I was a very defensive child because I had to be. I kept everybody at arm's length. I want that love, but I'm scared to receive it. I'm scared that you might leave after you love me. But after more visits to Halo, Marjay started opening up. As she grew, her story just started to change a little bit, a little bit. She started having these little pivotal moments. The room was just full of love. There's art supplies everywhere. And as an artsy creative child, I was in heaven. I could tell that she was using words to process the things that she had been through and try to work through them on paper. In high school, Marjay discovered her passion for poetry and started competing at the national level. I wrote my first poem about a traumatic childhood experience. Poetry provides a lot of relief. Like the sky before a much needed rain. She was one of our best poets. Individuals in the audience who are complete strangers to her are in tears. Um, she's touched them in such a way. When I write, I write in pen because it's permanent. And although some feelings aren't permanent, you have to remember where you come from in order to grow and get to where you've been. Now 20 years old, Marjay is studying journalism on a full ride scholarship to the University of Missouri and returns to Halo to lead writing workshops for teens. Marjay has such an incredible story of resilience to share. She's like a megaphone for these kids who are suffering through the same type of thing that she did. They can see themselves in her. Poetry has saved my life in multiple different ways. If somebody gets something from my poem and my experiences, then <laughs> my job is done. In February, Marjay shared her story in a documentary that debuted at Halo's annual auction. The event raised $650,000 for homeless youth. But it was Marjay who received the biggest surprise of all. So there's someone else who heard your story and wanted to interview you. Hello. Hi. Hello, Marjay. <laughs> Hi. I'm so glad to meet you. It was, it was surreal. I would never in a million years would have thought that you would be saying my name. When you read your words, you know that that comes from such a deep, powerful, and soulful space. You're a shining example of what is possible for everybody. What a journey for Marjay. She is showing you that artistry can really create a path for success. Where you come from doesn't define who you are, but it can influence where you go. Anything is possible if you put in the work, if you move with love and you have passion and purpose. Words can be extremely powerful, especially messages of kindness and gratitude. And a few teachers in Detroit wanted to remind their students just how powerful words can be. Kate Snow has that story. At Roseville Middle School near Detroit, the simplest of projects is reminding students and staff about the power of words. Are you wondering why you're here? Yeah. <laughs> Reading teacher Stacy Earle had a big idea. What did you ask your staff to do? I asked my teachers, secretaries, custodians, our cooks at lunch to write a card to a student, anyone of their choice, of Thank you. why they inspire them. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So this year, they surprised some of the students with handwritten notes of gratitude. The reason why we invited you down here today is because we wanted to tell you that you inspire Miss Moore and I to come to work every day. 
The kids had their parents' permission to be filmed by the school. You're amazing. Thank you and so I love you. <laughs> you can see the experience was profoundly moving for both for students and staff. You give me so much love in my heart, and I love having class with you guys. So I wanted to give you and say thank you. Come here. Okay, now a real hug. <laughs> oh. Oh. You're amazing. <laughs> English teacher Emily Grimes presented letters to four students, including Amaya Brown. What is it about Amaya that you wanted to recognize? Her, her leadership. I narrowed it down to her because I, I guess the bottom line is that she's shown me that she's there for me as I am there for her. I wrote something for you. Social worker Julie Cooper's yeah, message brought eighth grader Alicia Turner to tears. To I'm really grateful you're here. Oh, oh, you okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. She is an inspiration for me um, to come to work, and I really cherish the relationship that we have. She gave you good advice when, it, when you need it. More than 50 heartfelt letters in all, lifting up students and educators alike. You light up our classroom with your kindness, and you are going to make the world a better place. So. Showing up for each other in the most basic but powerful way. For Sunday Today, Kate Snow. Just ahead, a viral video to boost your day. We have one more video that will surely brighten your day. Check it out. All right, when it comes to big awards over the years, you've heard a ton of people say this. It's just an honor to be nominated. <laughs> but for one elementary school kid in California, it's a whole lot better to win. <laughs> a student with terrific leadership skills. Congratulations, Franklin. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, my God. Right. oh, yeah. Doing the happy dance. Oh Franklin! That's how adults feel yeah. inside. That's how yeah. we, don't, we don't show it, but that's how we yeah. feel inside. That's exactly right. He took home oh, again yeah. that terrific leadership oh, award. It's first award. Kid. Very first time. Kid is doing it. That's You're right, Carson. That's a beautiful point. Yeah. Kids do on the outside what we think on the inside. Uh, Love those. Always leaves us with a smile. Well, that is it for today. We're going to see you next week for more on The Boost right here on Today All Day. I'm a morning person. I love the morning, and I love sharing that joy with our audience. You make a choice to spend time with us, and that's very special.
folks, and welcome back to another episode of Pop Start Plus. We are jam packed. We were jam packed this week. Man, we had so many cool visits from celebrities, and I'm really eager to share with you some of our favorite moments on this week in review. We're talking about John Stamos, Taraji Pienzen, Brooke Shields, and Chloe Bailey all stopped by to give us the scoop on their latest projects. Plus, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary, if you can believe it, of the beloved film The Sandlot with a look back at the conversation with some of the cast about that movie's long-lasting impact. Lots to do, let's get right to it. You might know him as Uncle Jesse from Full House, but these days, John Stamos has quite the full plate. He's gonna be making an appearance on season two of That's My Jam, hosted by Jimmy Fallon. It's a spinoff of The Tonight Show game where they have celebrities come in and compete in a series of music challenges. So John Stamos stopped by our third hour to chat all about it. Well, John Stamos has been entertaining us for decades, from his breakout role as Blackie Parrish on General <laughs> Hospital, and to his longtime collaboration playing alongside the Beach Boys. I love these pictures. This is a "This Is Your Life," I know, I and of I course, <laughs> as, Uncle, <laughs> as of course, as Uncle Jesse in Full House and later Fuller House. Well, as you know, John also recently put his vocal skills to hey. test on Jimmy Fallon's musical game show "That's My Jam," challenged to perform a rendition of YMCA, but. <laughs> Not the one we know. Yeah. I stood in Uber with Tim Chalamet. Not the actor, just some guy from LA. We ain't buffalo wings. There was five new boy. Hungry Moose is the best place for it. I stood in Uber with Tim Chalamet. Not the actor, just some guy from LA. Now I'm never going to get that version. I know. Here we go. We've been singing around the house. My beautiful wife's here, and she was singing it. She's been, we just keep singing it. The other night, she's singing it in bed. I'm like, don't <laughs> sing about Tim Chalamet. And <laughs> Yeah, that's, right. puts a damper yeah, it wasn't even, things, doesn't it? Hey, Al. <laughs> yes, sir. You are a superhuman. God bless you, and I'm so oh. glad you're well and doing great. Well, thank and I don't know what you do, but I we got to get into it. Right? <laughs> well, I'm very fortunate. I got a supportive family and supportive friends, so wow. yeah, that, so that certainly helps. So, so what was it like going head to head with all these other folks on <laughs> on That's My Jam? Because I mean, because Taraji P Henson came to play with She's you. She's great, but yeah. she was my teammate, which right. was good. Um, I'm not good at uh, doing stuff on the fly. I've, I've done musicals, and, but I like to practice. I like yeah. to rehearse. Uh, and uh, so it, it takes a while. But, but um, my son, who hates watching me on TV, I thought, well, he probably will like this. Yes. And he's watching, watching, he goes, you're cheating. You cheated, Dad. <laughs> No, I didn't. How, how did you cheat? Yeah, what is this whole thing, well, you and Taraji? This, I'm calling it she cheat cheated, but, um, <laughs> No, well, he thought I was cheating because, well, there was a thing with a horn and bup, 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 and I was kind of singing the lyrics, but we won. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 It's all about it. It's all about it. I love it. I uh, couldn't help but notice, you know, you and Jimmy rocking the beard. Um, oh, yeah. And then on The Tonight Show, you and Jimmy not rocking the beard. Right. So who's copying who He's at this point? He's copying me, for oh, okay. sure. Okay. That's a snap on beard, him. His wasn't. Oh. Mine was real. On, just I don't think right he can. On. Yeah, he can't yeah. grow hair. You are. <laughs> he can't grow hair. You have one of the most highly anticipated memoirs uh, coming out later this year, as, as I read. And the title, I want to make sure I get this title right. It's, it's you've. The title is If You Would Have Told Me. That's going to be, the, there's a cover right there. If you would have told me that I would be on the Today Show with all of you. <laughs> all right, yeah. right. But seriously, and your book was beautiful. I, I just started reading it, but the, you. the journey that you, you took with your father, and he's still around and sober yeah. and everything good. Uh, yes, he What is. a beautiful uh, ending. Th mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading the book, too. But did you find, I found the process during the pandemic to be among Terrible. the most, no, <laughs> yes, no. and cathartic, though. Cathartic, 100%. Did you find it to be oh, the same? Yeah. Yes, yes. I, it took me a few months to get into it. I never wanted to write a book. I never thought, first of all, I wasn't interesting enough. I didn't want to tell stories that, you know, I shouldn't be telling, which I haven't. But then um, I was a father, and that moved me, and it's something I've always wanted. And then my friend Bob died, and yeah. so I thought, Absolutely. you know, I, 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 and he's sort of a through line to the whole book, and, um, you know, it's a tragic thing. How but, much yeah. do you miss him? <laughs> it pretty much a lot, you know, a lot. I, I would, he'd be watching me this morning, he'd say, you're not talking about me enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's complaining up in heaven somewhere. Like, uh, he was, you know, one of my dearest friends and a, a beautiful man. But he never left anything off the table. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, he always said, I love you, I'm proud of you, you know. And so that's a good lesson, yeah. I think. You know, tomorrow's never promised. One of the greatest yeah. huggers ever. He's a good hugger, <laughs> yeah. Can't wait to, can't, cannot wait to read your book. When's it come out, by the way? October. 
October. You're going to so come back and talk about it? For sure. Yes, I'd love to. Is there going to be an audio version? Do we get to hear it? Of course, yeah. Oh. Did you, you, did you, I was starting to read yours, yeah. That was harder than writing the book. Uh, did you yeah, cry, right? And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's emotional. It, the whole thing is, is very emotional. Yeah. Uh, it's true. Oh, but it's going to be um, a great gift to your son. Yes, he's, uh, you know, he's the light of our life now, and it's, uh, it's something I've always five. wanted. He's going to be five next week. Oh, oh, my goodness. He's going to be five. I'm going to be 60, and he's, you know. <laughs> um, so he just gets me young. Just gets better. He keeps young. Yeah, right? Yeah, really does. John, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, John. John. Thank you all very much. That sounds like a great time. Always great to hear from John Stamos, who just looks incredible. Makes me mad. Coming up next, we're catching up with the star of the new Peacock original, Chloe Bailey. She's in Praise This, a drama about a musical superstar forced to join a struggling praise team headed to a national competition. Chloe gave us the scoop. Take a look. The lovely, the multi-talented Chloe Bailey. The five-time <laughs> Grammy nominee. She's so busy right now. Her debut solo album, In Pieces, is out just now. She's also starring in Peacock's new movie. It's called Praise This. And we're so happy to have you with us, Chloe. Lots to talk about, lots to sing about. You're going to perform for us in a moment. Yes. But first, tell me about the new album. It's uh -huh. just out. How does it feel to have it I don't know, out in the universe? Man, it feels amazing. I haven't felt as content as I do right now. Mm. I got everything that I needed to say off of my chest and I'm just filled with complete gratitude. Mm. I'm so excited to be singing in pieces, which is the title track for the album, because we all have those moments where it's hard to pick our own selves up off the floor mm. and we need those around us to help us. So that's what this song's about and mm. I'm so excited to perform. Well, it's all you. I mean, you produced it, you've arranged it. Like this is every, this is like your heart and soul. Literally. Why was this the right time, do you think, for this, for this album to come out? I feel like no matter how much I try to plan things, God always has a better plan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from Swarm then to mm -hmm. my album and mm -hmm. then Praise This and then Tour, it's like I couldn't have come up with a better plan. Uh -huh. And everything happens in its right timing. Mm. Amen to that. Uh -huh. Let's talk about Praise This. Yes. It's on Peacock, a new movie. Tell us about it. Yes, so I play a girl named Sam. She is a struggling musician uh -huh. who is willing to do anything but and whatever to make it. Time. And so her dad forces her to live with her extended family in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and she ends up finding herself with the Praise, Days, Praise Team competition. So I love that. You know, we, I feel like we've watched you and your sister grow up. I remember when you performed here in our studio for one of the first times, mm. you had the love of Beyonce and her mom and her family. And I remembered thinking to myself, my gosh, these two are going to be powerhouses. And it's turned out that way. Your Thank sister, you. of course, is the Little Mermaid. You've got all these projects. Um, just tell us about what this ride has been like for you and your sister. This ride has <laughs> been even more than what I could have imagined and yeah. expected. And I know little Chloe is so proud of the Chloe right now. <laughs> I would dance around in my bedroom, pretend like I was giving concerts. <laughs> I remember when we were here last time, yeah. Sis and I, I was on the grand, we were singing Fall, and <laughs> now I'm here on my own. So it's like we're both growing so strong together and individually, Oof. and I couldn't be more proud of her. Uh, wow. She's Beautiful. probably watching right now, uh -huh. proud as well. That. You can catch Praise This starting today on Peacock. When we come back, don't miss our good friend Taraji P. Henson.
everybody. Welcome back to Pop Star Plus. You know, it's always a blast when the great Taraji P. Henson swings by our studio. Whether she's acting, running a business, writing a book, she's always got a cool project up her sleeve. So she paid us a visit to Studio 1A to let us know what she's been up to. We are catching up with one of our favorites, Taraji P. Henson, taking home a Golden Globe Award and earning an Emmy nomination for her role as Cookie Lime in the hit series Empire. She's also been nominated for an Academy Award for her performance in Benjamin Button. Well, now Taraji is focusing on a project that is near and dear to her heart. It is called the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation. So good. The foundation is trying to improve access to mental health care for the black community. And Taraji is here with us with an amazing announcement. Taraji, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. This has been such a deal. You've changed a good deal. You've changed so many lives through it. But for people who may not be familiar with the foundation, how did it get started? It got started out of my own necessity and searching for um, therapy for myself and my son and looking for someone culturally competent was uh, a, a task. Challenge, yeah. yeah, it was uh, quite a challenge. And, you know, I'm privileged. I can afford $350 a pop, but what about the community that can't? Mm -hmm. And just the um, the stigma that surrounded around mental illness in the black and brown community, and I just felt inclined to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I started the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation. And, and then you're going to even reach out changing more lives because you got a partnership with Kate, with Kate Spade. Yes. Uh, your foundation is teaming up to do something, uh, uh, She Cares Pod. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that's going to take place on HBCU campuses. Talk oh, about that. Cool. So these pods are there um, to, again, you know, every day we're trying to eradicate the stigma. So the more we talk about it, the more people feel free enough to express how they are feeling. Mm -hmm. And so we are putting these pods on HBCU wow. campuses and we're offering um, free mental therapy um, mm -hmm. for, uh, it's virtual, we'll have live sessions as well. You have yoga, we have all oh, kinds wow. of, it's, cool. yeah, yeah, and you got to think about it. I, when I was in college, we didn't have anything like this. So if I knew someone suffering, I wouldn't even know where to tell them sure. to go. So this is a spot where people can exactly. go. Exactly. Safe space. There are rest space. pods, um, rest pods. If you just need to decompress, wow. um, they have classes, yoga classes, um, art, dance. Wow. Um, teach psycho um, therapy to students, and just make them more aware and mm -hmm. being comfortable with talking and expressing how they are that. feeling mentally. What you mentioned, if you were in college, you went to an HBC. You, you went to you graduated Howard from Howard University, University yeah. and I, I, was, <laughs> I was wondering I was thinking about I mean think back to that time for you how would your life have been different mm. if you had had this at your disposal back then it would have been I mean, I know a lot of students wouldn't have dropped out. Do you know that 60% of the dropout um, students that drop out are because of mental health problems? Six zero. Wow. Six zero. And 50% wow. of that 60% did not have access to mental health mm. resources. So we're giving hassle-free mental health resources on campuses. We're the students it is needed. Yeah. It is. It's a great concept. Yeah. It's a great Thank idea. You. Um, I understand you also went on a trip yourself uh, recently to, to Bali. Mm. I did. How, how was that? I it, read that it was life-changing. It was life changing. I'm a better person because of it. Yeah, there it is. Um, yeah, I was it like an wall. Eat, Pray, Love journey? It definitely was an Eat, Pray, Love. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I, I I chose to go by myself because I wanted to stay wow. present. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have new oh, you conversations. Went by yourself. Yes, and I met new people. I had this beautiful community that we still keep in touch. Oh. And it was just life changing oh. for me. I, I tapped into a joy and a happiness that I lost. For Ooh, some time. that's so good. Yeah. I was just telling you, we had John Stamos on. Was that just this week that yeah. John Stamos was yeah, here? Right. Uh, she Monday. was his partner Monday. on NBC's yeah. That's My Jam. Tell me about that experience. <laughs> People are loving this show. It's so much You fun. guys were fun. Yeah, the <laughs> only part I don't approve of is the water. The water. Oh. What was you know, the you, surprise splash? What was that? Well, if you, if the other team gets oh. the lyrics right, oh. then you get oh. splashed. Oh. Oh. And oh. I, oh. Stop it. You can never be prepared <laughs> for that water coming at do you they, like did, that. Did anybody know about black women in hand? <laughs> the last time I was on the show, I was like, you can't be squatting women, black women, when you turn into chia pets. I swear, <laughs> Oh, that was good. I, I hear, Taraji, is it true that, that that episode of That's My Jam got you your current role on, on Abbott Elementary? It sure did because wow. I'm such a fan of the show uh, and I told Quentin how proud of her I was and I was like, if you ever need, you know, I love you that. on the show, just call me and she did. And so, wait, that's amazing. Oh, my God. 
Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> yes, exactly. The squeaky wheel always gets there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Roger, thank you for coming in. And congratulations on the announcement. Yeah. Thank so you. Inspiring. Wonderful. Uh, most importantly, the Boris Lawrence Henson Foundation and Kate Spade will launch their first She Cares pod at Alabama State okay. University, oh. a public HBCU that's in Montgomery, Alabama, on April 14th. You are just... <laughs> Doing Thank the Lord's you. work. Doing it, I right. have to. My father said if you are blessed, you have to be a blessing. Amen. Oh. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Was great. Honestly, one of our faves, Taraji. Uh, love you. Always doing cool things. Great to have her here at Today. Now on to another powerhouse rising to fame through modeling and classic films like Pretty Baby and Alice, Sweet Alice. We're talking about the one and only Brooke Shields, who has graced uh, magazine covers and screens for more than 40 years now. There's a new documentary called Pretty Baby Brooke Shields Chronicles Her Life and how she harnessed her internal power and she navigated her career. Brooke joined Hoda and Jenna to chat about it. You just didn't go anywhere that somebody wouldn't know Brooke Shields. The most photographed woman in the world. Iconic American beauty. Object of desire. A sexualized child model. Exploitation. Vulnerable. I was on the cover of Time magazine as the face of that whole era. Who decides that? She was catapulted into the world of adult sexuality. I just always remember thinking, like, I hope she's okay. She was a young girl in an all-adult world. I'm amazed that I survived any of it. Oh All right. my gosh. We've been talking about this documentary. We've, we've been waiting for you to come here. We're oh. so happy that you're here. But what you just said at the end of the clip struck both Jenna and I that you're amazed you survived this. Yeah, the word That survive. statement is so heavy and weighty. What did you mean by that? And, and thrive, too. Yeah. I mean, when, when you see what I was... Um, put up against from the time I was quite young. And you see it, you can see it in my face too. Yeah. I start to just disassociate. Yes, you could tell. I just, and that, I was protecting myself without even knowing what I was doing. What it was did just you all have to so survive? Much. Like what were the things? Just scrutiny and vitriol and anger and pitchforks and blame and hatred to my mother and, you know, and it was like all of this stuff, I was always on my, on the defensive, always. Yeah. Defend your mother, protect your mother. Um, you know, you know, just no, no, no. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm really a good girl. I'm really a nice girl. Yeah. I'm, a, you know, and it was just like <gasps> trying to oh. convince people. I yeah. feel like. Yeah, and also, you know, I mean, I, I've got to watch this. Hoda mm -hmm. and I both mm -hmm. did, and we were astounded. I was astounded by the fact that also people came to you thinking they knew you. Mm -hmm. Like we yeah. got to see all of these interviews with mainly men in the documentary that would say, "But you're this way," mm -hmm. and it was like you weren't allowed to be. Nuance. Yeah. You weren't allowed to be you. Yeah, you had to they be one, either sexy or a virgin no, right. or this or that. I mean, there's one that doesn't make it into the documentary, but there is this woman who asked me the same question repeatedly. And I finally, you see me, I must be 13, and I say, I'm so sorry, ma'am, but I don't think you want my answer because I keep answering it and I don't have any other truth. And, you know, you look at that and you think, okay, that was a kid that was searching for her own truth. Well, and I also think a kid searching for her own voice. I yes. felt like you were seeking it. And as a kid, often we're pleasers. Are they happy? Are they happy? Is the interviewer happy? Is the person sitting next to me happy? Are my parents happy? Yeah. Are your parents the, happy? We but do how, it. As women, we really do it. How yeah. long did it take? And do you remember when that you decided, like, this is me? Like, when you feel that settling inside you. I, I think it's been at times different parts. Yeah. Like going to university mm -hmm. was huge for me because mm -hmm. it, it, I didn't know that I could think, you know, I didn't know that I could have an opinion about something that, you know, the way I regarded a piece of literature was my own opinion, you know? And so that was the first thing and that sort of happened. Like, I have a, I'm smart. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I learned that, yeah. And then, and then after that, it was um, basically suddenly Susan and Broadway because those were the things that I found my talent on my own terms. Mm. Yeah. And about That's so good. much more than just looks. Totally. There was something else in it, and I just, I like bloomed from that. So yeah, that, that was, and then, you know, you're having families and yeah. kids, yes. and you sort of, I think you keep realizing more about yourself. Yeah. The yeah, looks part is was it was actually really hard to sort of swallow because you were told from the time you were a baby and you are beautiful that you were this one thing. You actually say in the documentary you wouldn't even look at yourself yeah. in the mirror. Yeah. In fact, I would take dance class and fall all the time because you're supposed to spot. You're supposed to look mm. at yourself, and I would just. What did you see when you looked? I 
I didn't even know what I saw. I just, I just knew I wasn't going to see what other people saw. Mm. Oh. So it was like, oh, I'm going to be disappointed. So they'd say, yeah. well, do you like your hair and makeup? And I'd be like, yeah, it's great. Looks so, perfect. That's Let's good, move that's on. Good. I'm not, you know, that's arrogant. That's uh -huh. self, that's ego. That's... But it's also because you heard from everybody you're this one thing. Right. Yeah. And you're and a pretty baby. You're a beautiful yeah. girl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were more, much more I mean, than my that. My mother called me a piece of art. Like, yeah. really? You know, <laughs> you know, but she believed it. Yeah. Now, that, I think that, your mom, that's an interesting topic, because I think a lot of people would expect you to say, how could you have done that to me, mom? How did you put me through that? But you, that was not your mantra at all. Was there any part of you, or is there any part of you, as you reflect now as a mom yourself, like, was that the right Thing. Oh, absolutely. But as a mother, I look at it. Yeah. Do you know? But as a daughter, I was so busy trying to keep her alive and protect her against the world. And and she was an alcoholic. So there's that 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 really, you know, and that people pleasing piece. So mm -hmm. I was in that role with her, you know? And she was so broken. Yeah. And even as a child, I had like not pity in the bad in a bad way, but like respectful pity if there is yeah. such a thing. Like but you were worried about I her. I was just like, oh, what a shame! Like you, this is you have demons, and you don't, and I don't want you to. So I kind of was just like, she thought she was doing a, the right thing. You yeah. know, a lot of her decisions I would have not made, right. well, I wouldn't make today for my girls, but I wasn't a mother then. Wow, it looks like a really cool documentary there, and our best as always to the great Brooke Shields. Coming up after the break, we're revisiting a conversation with the stars of The Sandlot 30 years later. My goodness, stay with us. And thanks for sticking with us. It is Popstar Plus. So 30 years ago today, The Sandlot hit theaters. It's the beloved story of a kid's baseball team in the summer of 1962, navigating friendships and first crushes and, of course, all the many challenges of growing up. The coming-of-age film reminds a lot of us about our own childhood summers and has remained a fan favorite for more than 30 years since it debuted in 1993. NBC News correspondent Gotti Schwartz caught up with the cast back in 2018. And in honor of the film's anniversary, take a look. It's been 25 years since the kids of the Sandlot spent the summer in their own little baseball kingdom. They never kept score. They never even really stopped playing the game. The square, Betty! Get the square! And 25 summers later, the guys from the Sandlot are back together. But there were only eight of them. 
didn't have a whole team, so even though I wasn't in the sandlot, I figured I could be the ninth man and just go sit in the outfield somewhere and ask them how things have been going. It's been crazy. I mean, it definitely gets you in places for, for free. <laughs> <laughs> Can't walk through a Las Vegas casino without someone yelling, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wait, you're yeah, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, you mean that's the same guy? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, has aged better than the rest of us. But there they were, Scotty Smalls, DeNunez, Timmy Timmons, Tommy Repeat, Bertram, Squints, and Ham. You're killing me, Smalls! Even the narrator, who is also the writer and director, David Mickey Evans. The only one missing, Benny the Jet Rodriguez. We gotta get Mike, we gotta do the documentary. Yeah. It's called Finding Benny. <laughs> Finding Benny. <laughs> yeah, come on, Mike. Mike. And stick your glove out in the air. I'll take care of it. Unlike the movie, none went on to play for the Dodgers, but over the last couple decades, that ragtag team has found itself honored by some of baseball's greatest. The Great Bambino! Is it wild to know that a lot of these MLB superstars grew up watching The Sandlot and grew up wanting to play exactly like you guys? I think it's awesome. That's the truth. They made a big impact on a lot of people's lives. And it's not just baseball stars who are Sandlot struck. This is Kevin Durant's Twitter picture. I am Kevin Durant. It's a little known fact. And uh, I'll ball you up. <laughs> but when it comes to inspiring their own kids. I showed him the movie for the first time. And uh, he's really big on Moana. Squints didn't marry Wendy Peppercorn. So little pervert! But life's good, and he's got a teenager. I think she thinks I'm just a kind of a dork, so. <laughs> <laughs> but for my generation, the Sandlot defined the summer. The film was made with the same amount of love that people have for it, and it was the greatest summer of our lives. What was your favorite scene? When the treehouse blew up, that was my big moment. The scene I did where they lift me over the fence and I come face to face with the dog. It was pretty neat having stunt guys, though. Right? I did my own stunts in the film. <laughs> <laughs> and these days, with Yeah Yeah looking more like Hercules, you gotta wonder, can these guys still play? I don't believe it. Some a little rusty. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Sorry. It wasn't a sandlot, but we're old men, and LA City College had some grass. Hurry up, batter. It's gonna be a short game, and I gotta get home for lunch. Here we go, big NBC exec up to the plate. Come on, big boy. Hold on, look at how he's I'm choking up. <laughs> That's I'm a choke nervous. Up. Don't be a goofus. All right, come on. <laughs> Boom! The Nunez is on the plate. Timmy Timmons on first base. Oh, boy. You better start stealing bases, oh, no, man. Uh-oh, look at it. <laughs> Stole that one. Finally up to bat, the Sultan of Smack Talk, the king of calling it out. Oh! You got it! <laughs> I'm not even gonna run. I'm not even gonna run. And as we all rounded home. Seeing these guys, some of them I haven't seen in 25 years, but it is just like we're back. The great Hambino reminding us heroes get remembered. All your heart can. Never go wrong. But legends never die. I can't believe it's been 30 years since the Sandlots released that interview you just saw with Gotti. That was when their anniversary was their 25th. What a classic. We'll be right back right after this.
That is all we've got for you today. We hope you enjoyed uh, the little recap we put together of our week. Thanks, as always, so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week right here on Popstar Plus. Have a good one. Spring has sprung. You're cordially invited to join me, Elizabeth High School, for an outdoor brunch in my hometown, Oxford, Mississippi. Honey, I've catered many brunches over the years, and let me tell you, I've learned a trick or two, and I'm gonna share them with you. From creating an event that's simple yet elevated, to building a menu that's easily plated. Pouring simple sips that will leave you feeling just fine. You don't have to go overboard to have a good time. These tips will make planning oh so fast and will have you making memories that will last. So let's get to it. We've got a lot to do. Welcome to Mississippi. We're so excited to have you. I love planning parties. And the beginning is when all of your creative juices are flowing. And this is one of my favorite ways to kind of rein everything in and start to really get a path that this party is gonna take. Whether you're a first time hostess or someone that caters parties all the time, I'm telling you, the key is to keep it simple. Because if you keep it simple, there's less stress, your cost is gonna be lower, and that means it's gonna be three times the fun. I'm gonna start pulling things that really resonate with me. I've decided that I really wanna have this brunch on the porch. In the South, we absolutely love our porches. And so that's why I've decided to go ahead and have a big long table on the front and that's where we're gonna have brunch. It's been a while since we've all gathered together. I think everyone's kind of been, you know, hibernating in their homes during winter. The idea of them all sitting around this wonderful long table, I think it's gonna be really magical. I normally gravitate towards pink. I have beautiful pink plates, I have pink napkins, but I've used them before. So I am gonna go in a different colorway. So we have lots of blue. So I really think that I'm gonna go with blue. It's the color of the sky. It's like a robin egg blue. To me, it just, it screams fresh and bright and fun. I love the combination of spring green and blue. There are a lot of ways that we can bring these colors in and that may be with the glassware or maybe it's with the plates, maybe it's with the napkins. I love flowers and these hydrangeas are really speaking to me. On our porch, we even had a little nest um, that had tiny baby birds in it last year and, and I really haven't been able to get over that. Maybe we can work birds into this some way. Nothing screams brunch like eggs. We need to think of something that's gonna hold that maybe even that we could reheat like a um, like a frittata or, oh, I know, I know. Yes, we'll do a quiche and then we can cook that ahead of time and then it reheats beautifully. I like to do something that is a little bit heartier, you know, maybe even with a pastry. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay, the sausage pinwheels. Let's think about those. So if we have the quiche, as my mom always said, well, what are you gonna have that's green on the plate? And I wanna remember that. So I'm gonna put this green here. Asparagus are in season right now, so that might be kind of fun. I feel like the salad is gonna look better on the plate. And then the dressing that's left over, we're gonna make that into a guest gift. So we can add that into something, maybe a baby mason jar with a lid and then put that Maybe at the door when they leave. No, 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 because then they're gonna forget it and nobody's gonna remember it. Oh, okay, no, I think what we'll do is we're gonna put that on the table. Yes, honey, we are getting ready. We are almost there. Then we need to think about dessert and spring is strawberries. And I'm thinking I'm just gonna buy a pound cake. We're gonna cheat that and that's okay. Sometimes we need a little break. Oh, a sweet twist on the classic. Okay, I'm glad I cut that one out because that reminds me. We need to think about a cocktail. Um, honestly, I'm kind of tired of mimosas. I love them, don't get me wrong, but I want to do something that's a little bit unusual and fresh. Yes, so lemons. So we'll do lemons instead of oranges, and we're gonna do my lemon sparkler. 
Still, we're gonna get those bubbles, that same festive feel, but just a little different takes. Okay, I'm really loving the way that this is looking. I think our menu is perfect. Lots that we can do ahead of time. We've committed to the blue and the spring green. So now that we've got this, another way that I get inspired is going to the fabric store. You can get a great deal on remnant fabric pieces and then I'll use that for the table runner. That way you're not committed to spending a lot of money on a tablecloth that you may only use once. This one seems a little bit too busy to me. Um, and then of course we love the birds. So I really do think that this is gonna be it. I absolutely love this. I just don't think that there's anything more spring-like than this runner. We're gonna come up with a schedule, and that will include everything from shopping to cooking, and then those final touches, the day of the party. We've drawn out our inspiration, and now we have a plan. So let's get to work. We've selected our runner, and we know it's gonna be the focal point. We need to make sure that it's pressed and ready to go. Once those are pressed, then we can pull out all of our plates, all of our glassware, and go ahead and find a spot in your home that you can leave all of this ready to go on the morning of the brunch. This is the perfect time to pull out those things that are special to you. For me, that's my silver strawberry baskets and colorful glasses. For things that you don't actually own, you can always borrow them from a friend. We know we're gonna give our vinaigrette as our guest gift. And this is the time when we have to decide what are we gonna put that in? Let's go ahead and get those things ordered and ready. This is also the time to go ahead and make your cook list. A cook list is a perfect way to manage your time in the kitchen. I'm gonna put the sausage pen wheels at the beginning and then it will lead all the way up to the day of the brunch. This is the point in time when you can go ahead and pull your vases out, get them washed and make sure that they're ready for the flowers. But listen, don't think that you have to break the bank when dealing with flowers. The secret to making a store-bought bouquet amazing is to cut it open and then use individual flowers and group them according to their color. These little vases are also perfect because you don't have to do a lot to them. Just a few buds and you're finished. And coming up next, we're gonna work on our menu. chosen a menu that is super simple. We're gonna start with sausage pinwheels, and then we have a beautiful quiche Lorraine, as well as a simple green salad with my versatile vinaigrette. And don't forget the pound cake with a little bourbon whipped cream and fresh spring strawberries. You know, you have to remember the whole goal of this brunch is to try to do as much as possible ahead of time. So we're gonna go ahead and start with the sausage pinwheels. We're gonna go ahead and put the puff pastry on our cutting board. So we just wanna flour our puff pastry just a little bit, just so that it doesn't stick to the roller. And I'm even gonna put a little bit of flour on my rolling pin. So we're gonna roll this out until it's just about the size of our rolling pin. And that's gonna be perfect. And now we're gonna take our sausage. So this is just breakfast sausage. It's not been cooked. And you know, I'm sorry, hands, are sometimes your best tool. And what you wanna do is just get a thin layer and it needs to be even so that when we do get ready to roll this, 
we don't have any spots that are too thick. So you wanna make sure that you're leaving a border. Really about an inch all the way around will be perfect. So now we're gonna sprinkle our cheese on top and then a few green onions. Just a sprinkle is really about all you need. So we're gonna roll this up on the longest side and what you wanna do is kinda roll and press. Roll and press. You wanna make sure that you're evenly rolling this and then I'll just kind of smoosh these ends down here. And now, as you can see, we have our little seam here. Just take your fingers and press it. And so now we'll just wrap it in plastic wrap and stick it in the refrigerator. It's gonna chill overnight. And then, right before our guests arrive tomorrow morning, we're gonna pull it out, we'll slice it, cook it, and everyone is going to love it. We're gonna go ahead and start on the quiche Lorraine. So we're gonna start with a purchased pie crust. And I'm not embarrassed about it or ashamed to admit it. We've got a lot of things to do to get ready for this party. And this is just a little time saver. We do want to flour our pie crust. So just give it a nice sprinkle. And then I'm also gonna sprinkle my rolling pin. And then we just want to roll it out a bit. And so we will take our crust. We're going to place it into our dish. So now you can see we have plenty of extra dough that's spilling over the side so that we can make a gorgeous ruffled edge. And you want to make sure that you fold these edges under, not only because it's going to be pretty, but also because it's going to cook evenly. And now if you'll take your two fingers and almost make a little V, and then you take your thumb here. And that's it, look, look at how easy. I mean, have you, oh my Lord, look at that. So it's very simple, it takes a little bit of time, but it's really gonna make the difference in the way this final quiche looks. And your guests will never guess that this crust was store-bought. But these are the little details that will make all the difference in this amazing brunch. And now we're gonna go ahead and add our bacon. Just know that with quiche, it's almost like a blank canvas. You know, there's hardly anything that you can't put in here that wouldn't be delicious. So if bacon is not your thing, I feel very sorry for you. Feel free to maybe add spinach or tomatoes. And now we'll add our cheese. And now it's time for the filling. We're just gonna crack one egg, and then we're gonna add our flour. So this recipe is a little bit different because we do add flour to the egg and whisk it very, very well. It helps to stabilize the custard, making it super light and very fluffy. So now that this is mixed, we can go ahead and add the rest of our eggs. So we wanna mix this very, very well. And now we're gonna go ahead and season this. So we're gonna add a pinch of cayenne and one half teaspoon of salt. And you know, normally we would say salt and pepper to taste. You really don't want to taste raw eggs. So that's why we're being really precise on this. And also eggs really need to be seasoned well. And now that's been mixed in. And we're gonna add our cream. And there we are. Just a little cream. <laughs> I mean, you know, there is nothing wrong with a little cheese, bacon, butter, and cream. <laughs> and so now, we are gonna use a whole nutmeg. If you don't have whole nutmeg or can't find it, you can certainly use the nutmeg that's already ground, but I do have to tell you, it's worth the effort. This step is pretty important in the final product and the way that it tastes. And now this is completely mixed in. We're gonna pour it right over our cheese and bacon mixture. We're gonna just mix up the bacon and the cheese a little bit. So we have 10 friends coming tomorrow and I decided to go ahead and make two quiches just to make sure that everybody has enough. And then this is gonna go into a 350 degree oven until it's completely cooked. The great news is about a quiche is that it doesn't mind being reheated. The quality will be the exact same. The taste will be the exact same. What you're looking for is a beautiful golden crust 
but then you have to make sure that the middle is set. You can even take a knife and insert it, and if it comes out clean, then you know you are ready to pull these quiches out. So we're gonna put these on the board to cool, and once they've cooled completely, we're gonna cover them before we put them in the refrigerator. And then tomorrow, before our guests arrive, we'll just have to reheat them. So now the quiche is done and it's in the refrigerator. So we can go ahead and make our vinaigrette. Obviously, we don't want to dress the salad this early because it would be a soggy mess, but we can make this vinaigrette ahead of time. So we're gonna start with apple cider vinegar. And there aren't many ingredients to this vinaigrette, but each one of them is very important. Now we will add our honey, and that's really gonna kind of offset the tartness of the apple cider vinegar. And then we have our garlic, and then Dijon. Most vinaigrette recipes that you see have the addition of some type of mustard. So we have two things that do not love each other. We have oil and we have vinegar. And I kind of consider the Dijon sort of a, it's like the marriage counselor between two people that don't get along. It's really gonna help bind the ingredients to make a smooth, velvety vinaigrette. Now we're gonna season with our pepper and then we have our salt. Now, I do wanna give this a nice whisk. Make sure that this is thoroughly mixed, and then we're gonna add our olive oil. You wanna make sure that you slowly drizzle the oil. Because we have so few ingredients in a vinaigrette, the technique really is important. This does take a minute, and you have to be patient, but this really will ensure that our vinaigrette is gonna be velvety and smooth and not broken. You know, I love to give a guest gift. And since I was making this vinaigrette anyway, it was a no brainer. So we just doubled the recipe and now we're gonna fill these little jars, tie them with a blue ribbon, of course, since that's the theme that we're working with for this spring brunch. I mean, are these not adorable? So now these are all done and ready for our guests. It's just a little way of letting them know that you're thankful that they came. And you know, when you get invited somewhere, your first question should be, well, what can I bring? As a guest, you also wanna bring your hostess a gift. And I will tell you that one of my favorite things to bring to a hostess is maybe cinnamon rolls or muffins. I know that the hostess has been incredibly busy getting ready for the day, and it would be nice to have something for them to enjoy the next morning. So that's it for the savory part of this brunch. And next, we're moving on to dessert and drinks, my favorite part. And now it's time for my favorite part, dessert. 
We're making a pound cake with bourbon whipped cream and macerated strawberries. We're gonna start with the whipped cream. A chilled bowl really is the secret to making sure that your whipped cream whips up beautifully and fluffy. So we have our chilled bowl. We're gonna add our heavy cream. And then we have powdered sugar. And now we'll add our vanilla. And then we're gonna use a hand mixer. So we're gonna start slow and then gradually take the speed up. So as if heavy cream and sugar aren't enough, we're gonna add a little bit of bourbon to this. Just put a little bit in the whipped cream, a little bit in our mouth. Mmm, God, that's good. We're gonna whip just a little bit more. We really wanna whip it till it's just a little bit under stiff peaks because we're gonna put this in the refrigerator and let it chill overnight. And then tomorrow, after the guests arrive and we're about to serve dessert, we'll pull it out of the refrigerator, we're gonna give it a good whisk and re-fluff it. So now we're gonna cover it and put it in the refrigerator until tomorrow. So now that the whipped cream is finished and in the refrigerator, we're gonna go ahead and start on our berries. I just think that there's hardly anything more perfect in spring than strawberries. And this is one of the easiest ways to prepare strawberries. We're just gonna remove the tops of the strawberries add them to our bowl and then we want to bring in our sugar so we're just going to give this a nice dusting of sugar so you want to make sure that you mix this well and that the sugar is evenly distributed over the strawberries that way it's going to make a really beautiful syrup that's going to be fabulous when we get ready to top this pound cake okay that looks beautiful we'll go ahead and cover it so the good news about these strawberries is that they really need to sit overnight in order to create that wonderful syrup, which works perfectly for our stress-free brunch because we can do it ahead. So now we've got these covered and they're gonna go in the refrigerator. We're dusting this store-bought pound cake with a little bit of powdered sugar and that's gonna make it look even more homemade. We're trying to eliminate any steps for tomorrow. So I'm gonna go ahead and slice the pound cake. Now, I don't want it to dry out so all I'm gonna do is make these slices and then cover the cake as well as the cake stand. And then tomorrow, all we have to do is take it off the stand and put it on the plate. That's so easy. And now we'll use our clear wrap to wrap the entire cake stand. And then we can put this aside and it's done until tomorrow. And now comes the fun part, when we get to test our cocktail recipe. So this lemon sparkler is in my cookbook, Come On Over, and it's super simple. One of the things that you wanna remember when making a cocktail for a party is that you really need to test it a day or two before, just to make sure that you have your measurements precise. There's nothing wrong with a little taste testing. So we're gonna start with lemon sorbet, and I love these melon ballers for this because you get just the right amount in the bottom of the glass. Now we're going to add the limoncello. The key to a really good cocktail is making sure that your measurements are precise. So that's why we're going to use a jigger for this. And now we'll top with champagne. Not everyone cares for alcohol and when planning a party you need to consider all of your guests and their needs. So we will leave one of these that we'll make into a mocktail. So instead of champagne, we're just gonna do a lemon seltzer that will be lovely. And the garnishes, they're really one way to elevate a simple cocktail like this. I love to finish it with a little bit of mint and maybe even a little lemon twist. And now for the very best part, the taste test. Oh, honey, that is absolutely perfect. Now that the menu's complete and the big day's almost here, we'll be back with a few finishing touches.
the day is finally here. And I'm so excited to welcome my guest. We've done most everything ahead of time, so this isn't gonna be stressful. So let's go get the pinwheels. Now we just have to unroll them and then slice them. And then we take these and put them on our sheet pan. Once we finish these, we will brush it with an egg wash, which will help it to brown really evenly. And we'll go straight into our oven. So these will go in first since they're gonna take longer. The quiches aren't gonna take very long to reheat. So now we'll go ahead and get our quiches out and get those reheated. We wanna make sure that we really cover them well before they go in the oven. Otherwise, they're gonna continue to brown and that is not what we want. Now we'll go ahead and pull our beautiful salad together when you're dressing a salad. It's like the toothpaste in a tube. Once it's out, you cannot put it back in. So we're gonna start slowly. Now, the taste test. It's absolutely perfect. You wanna always be able to taste the lettuce. We have beautiful spring greens and everybody wants to taste them. Now that the salad is made, we can go ahead and get our whipped cream. We wanna fluff it up a little bit. Do you see how the peaks are just falling over? That's the exact consistency that we want. These have got to stay chilled until right before we serve. We'll go ahead and pull our strawberries out. They've been sitting overnight. And so what we want to do is give them a nice stir. Oh, y'all, that syrup. Oh. oh, there's the doorbell. That must be Annie. Hey, Annie, Hi. how are you? Good. Oh, it's so good to see you. And what'd you bring me? Muffins. Oh, my Lord, I'm so excited. I asked her to come over and help with a few last minute details. So now it's just the flowers and we are done. Perfect. Didn't these turn out cute? I love them. Oh, it's just looking so pretty. I just love it. It's party time and I'm so excited. Hello. Hello. Oh, you're my first guest. Oh my around. gosh, I'm so, so good excited. to see Thank you. Thank you for Hi. having Hi. us. Once your guests arrive, all you have to do is pull them out of the oven. And so we'll just top with a little bit of fresh basil and that adds that pretty green. Does that not make all the difference? Okay guys, come on, let's sit down. Come on out and take a seat anywhere that you like. This is, this is gorgeous. This is gorgeous. Your flowers are beautiful. Y'all got lucky. So here we are, I hope y'all are hungry. This is my versatile vinaigrette recipe. We did them in these little jars for y'all to take home so you'll have a little keepsake. Oh, oh that's, that's so sweet. sweet. Isn't that Cheetos. sweet? And here is our quiche. Lucia, would you like me to serve you? That's really good. You know, I just feel like we've all been kind of, you know, huddled in our homes during winter and now that the weather's nice, I just wanted to get all my friends together. I've been missing y'all. Dude, who would you want to have brunch with? You could pick anybody. You. Me. Oh. Oh. That was cute. So okay, so I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready for dessert. So beautiful strawberries and bourbon whipped cream. Those look so good. Mm -hmm. I don't have the last time I had pound cake. This is so good. Yeah, I know. It's delicious. And there's nothing wrong with a little bourbon in your whipped cream. <laughs> I can't thank you all enough for coming. I am so grateful that y'all all came today to celebrate and to enjoy this wonderful spring brunch. You know, having a brunch doesn't have to be stressful. It can be easy and super fun, especially if you do things ahead, have a plan, and stick to it. Cheers, everyone! Cheers! Cheers.
Good morning, guys. Welcome to The Boost. I'm Hoda Kopi. we got a packed show for you. So April is Autism Awareness Month, and today we're shining a light on the disorder that affects more than 70 million people worldwide, including TikToks that teach acceptance and comic books with a cause. But let's start with a mother opening up about her son's journey while offering hope to other parents. Dylan Dreyer has her story. The second that I looked down at him when he was born, I just knew there was something about him. But as development went on, he met his physical milestones on time. It was Kate Swenson's maternal instinct that saved her son Cooper. While doctors, therapists, and teachers told her some boys are just late bloomers, she felt that a clock was ticking. No one would really take the what we were seeing seriously. Mm -hmm. And I was starting to panic because early intervention is key. Like, I want to help him catch up. According to experts, autism diagnosed before age five, when the brain is still forming, gives a child the best chance for successful treatment. And Cooper was just shy of his fourth birthday. How did they diagnose him? I know there's there's a, a spectrum. Yes, he's on the severe end of the spectrum. He's technically nonverbal and ooh, ooh. he's smart and he's funny <coughs> and he's loving. I honestly felt relief when they told me because I was like, now we know. The relief was short-lived as Kate and her husband, Jamie, realized their new normal was about to become a lifelong journey. Ooh. In her new book, Forever Boy, Kate writes about her son's invisible yet severe disability, one that made him look like every other child, but only on the outside. Once you got the diagnosis, what did you think your future would look like? I remember sitting there like, OK, there has to be more. Tell me what to do now. Mm -hmm. uh, no one would. The struggles were often intense. Cooper didn't speak. He ran away. He banged his head and was aggressive because he couldn't communicate. I really had some low points where we were dealing with those aggressions and I was really lost. When Cooper was two, Kate found out she was pregnant. Her son Sawyer was born without autism. Did you have reservations about having other children? We wanted more babies, and we didn't want to, to let this scare us to not having it. Buzz. Hey. But life with Cooper, who now could not socialize or be outside of their immediate family, drew Kate to a breaking point. It's just really hard. She began sharing her struggles in online blogs and videos called Finding Cooper's Voice. I just want him to be happy, and most of the time, that is enough. The secret world of autism is unbelievable. Her raw and honest posts helped create a supportive community for other families with autistic children. You just got to keep trying, keep hoping, realistically hoping. How do you find the strength and the, the motivation to keep trying so hard? I was missing Cooper's life. I was missing it being sad. I was missing it waiting for this to get better. I was like, I have to change the way I look at this. And with that realization came another seismic change in the Swenson family. Jamie and Kate divorced. I really felt like I was caring a lot by myself because while my husband was very hands-on, he was just a little bit behind in the autism acceptance, which is very common in couples. So um, I, I just, I needed to do it alone. After two years apart, Jamie and Kate remarried and added two more children to their family, a son, Harbor, who is three, and a daughter, Winnie, who is 10 months. Can I get that one more time? Yeah. Today, after years of intensive schooling, therapy, love, and very hard work, Cooper is an 11-year-old fifth grader now communicating with a tablet. And while it's not his actual voice, the words and phrases are sweet music to Kate's ears. He's going to have this great life. He's going to do so many things, and I hope that the world can learn to see that those things matter too. Coming up next, a brother-sister duo racking up millions of views on TikTok. Their videos provide a glimpse into life with autism, helping to break down stereotypes and spread joy. You were stranded on a desert island. Mm -hmm. What three things would you bring with you? Hot sauce. You can, <laughs> you can never go wrong with hot sauce. Hot sauce lover, sports fanatic, and Taco Bell enthusiast, 28-year-old Ryan McGuire is a star on TikTok. You went to Taco Bell without me? Did you want to go? Uh, yeah, I wanted to go. It's too late now. 
Ryan was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder at three years old. His 25-year-old sister, Brittany, known on TikTok as Taco Bell Queen, started sharing lighthearted videos of her brother she calls Rye Guy just a few years ago. How do I look? Her first post went viral overnight. What happened to your face? You don't like it? No. <laughs> Well, that's hurtful. Brittany continued to share more videos of Ryan, fans quickly falling in love with her brother's brutal honesty, quick wit, and joyful reactions. Ooh, the white New York Nick socks. What started as simple fun quickly turned into a platform to spread autism awareness. Now, over three million followers cheer on the McGuire siblings. Hoping to help other families, Brittany has been open about what it was like growing up with an autistic brother. One of the questions that I get a lot is, have Ryan and I always been close? The answer is no, honestly not. Brittany struggled to understand Ryan's disorder. Like many with autism, Ryan deals with communication challenges and anxiety. There would just be some moments where I would just break down in tears because I did not know how to relate to him. I didn't know, I didn't know how to talk to him. But the videos became a life-changing gift for the siblings. Those fun recordings helped forge an incredible bond. I feel like TikTok has tremendously improved our relationship. I love being around him. I am blessed to be his sister. He lights up every single room that he walks into. Lighting up rooms and spreading a message of acceptance. Here's one thing you all need to remember about autism, okay? Listen carefully. Autism is not an illness. Autism is how the brain functions. You're different, but you're not less. That's correct. No, now you need to post that on TikTok. Spread that message, yes. and we're so happy to help him do it. The dynamic duo, yes. Brittany and Ryan McGuire. Good morning. <laughs> good, morning. Good, morning. good morning. You're on the Today Show. Yes, I, we are. <laughs> we are. It's so exciting. Brittany, I mean, could you have imagined how this would take off, this little mm -hmm. video with your brother making fun of your face mask? <laughs> became a sensation. Honestly, no, And but it's it's been such a rewarding experience, and it's been beautiful for the both of us, and we're just so blessed to have what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a good uh -huh. time. Well, it was a real good time. It still mm -hmm. is. Ryan, <laughs> yeah. you, you walked in our studio and you lit the place up. You were just <laughs> sunshine. Yeah. So I can only imagine when people see you on the street uh -huh. now with your 3.4 million followers. Uh huh, 3.4 million. Is that million. crazy? <laughs> so what do they say when they see you? you know, well, when they, when they very first see me, it's like, Whoa, you're that right guy from TikTok. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whoa, you're, aren't you that right guy from TikTok? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, it's like, it blows my mind. What do you, do you like it? I, I love it. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah. What do you mm -hmm. say? What do you say back? Mm -hmm. I go, yes, I am. <laughs> sure am. It seems like you're comfortable being in public and you talk about anxiety. Has has uh, TikTok changed the way you feel? Oh, uh-huh. It, yeah. it really has, and it really has eased my anxiety level. Yeah. Like the social aspect of it, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of yeah. Stepping out of your comfort zone a yeah, little bit. Yeah, it's like I'm stepping out of my comfort zone and into the fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> into the fire. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> into the fire. The water's warm. Everyone loves you. You're a sensation. What has it meant for this relationship? Yeah. It's meant everything, honestly, because, you know, when kind of like in the, in the beginning of the video, when we were kids, it was really hard for me to kind of process and understand when I'm trying to really learn who I am, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, TikTok brought us together because it gave us a way to bond and to find something that we both enjoy, like having in common and everything. Because he's a big sports guy and he knows a lot more than I do. It, it, it helped us bond more. Absolutely. Yeah. It helped more. me get a better understanding. Ryan, what do you think people learn about autism yeah. when they see these mm -hmm. videos? Well, what they learn is they learn what autism is and they learn what autism Says how you want to be treated. How I want to be treated. Absolutely. How autism want, needs to be treated. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You said you're a huge sports fan. Yeah. What's your number one favorite, yeah. like basketball team? Knicks. It uh, is. It is like the, the Knicks. Knicks. Oh, well, love you know the what? Knicks. Can I tell you? I think the Knicks love you because look what they left. What are they leaving? They left a little. Oh. 
bag. Would you open that just see what's in there? <gasps> sure. <laughs> oh, wow, New York forever. Yeah. Uh -huh. Nice. I can hold, I can hold it. Uh -huh. Sure. What? Uh, what? Oh, oh, what's jersey. this? Whose jersey is There's that? <gasps> Who's oh boy, Derek Rose. <laughs> oh, we turned it around. Wait, Derek Rose. Is Derek Rose your favorite? Uh, yes. Wait, I think he might have signed it, it there, too. Oh, dude. He signed it? Wait a little bit. Put it down a little bit. Wait, down a little bit. <gasps> wait. Oh, look at that. Can I tell you something else? What? What's that? Ryan, uh, Derek, oh, I feel like he might know you. Take a look at the monitors monitor? and he hear what he has to say. Hey, what's up, Ryan? It's D Rose. I've been watching your TikTok videos from afar, and I love them. Thanks for being a fan. On behalf of the Garden of Dreams Foundation, we would like to invite you and your family to the Knicks and Knicks game tonight. Make sure you wear the jersey and don't forget, be safe. Dude, are you busy tonight? Can you go to the Knicks game? Oh, oh yeah, I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> what do you think? Hey, I love it. <laughs> love it. That's Derek Rose. That was my boy. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. So yeah. you're going to wear that jersey? Oh, you're going to yeah. be in the stands? Will you take oh, a picture for us yeah. so we can see? Oh, yeah, I'll take a pic. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Do a TikTok. Do better yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, well, this yeah. is awesome. And I know, um, Brittany, you're, you're a big yeah. Mavericks fan yeah. because Ryan told you. <laughs> Ryan told he me I was. You. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Does right. she love the Mavericks? She loves them. She loves them. <laughs> wow. Yes. We, will, we want to thank the Knicks again for the little swag bag and also for the invite for you. Y'all have a great time at the game. And thanks thank for the you. message you're spreading. It's thank more you. more than all this. We really appreciate it. And we want to mention, too, Brittany, you wrote a beautiful essay about your relationship. We encourage everyone to read it. It's on today.com. Thank you. Did thank you have fun here? So thank you all so much. We Absolutely. Had we had a blast. Oh, good. <laughs>we have a heartwarming story that shows just how far a father will go to help his son creating a popcorn factory that employs adults with autism like his son 100 percent of the profits go directly to the employees giving them a chance at a job they can be proud of here's craig melvin with that story you hear sam coming through the door and saying i made five batches of popcorn i'm exhausted dad just leave me alone <laughs> just can't put a price on it it's been a dream fulfilled for a devoted and determined dad. Steve Beer's 30-year-old son, Sam, has autism. He was four years old when his parents first noticed his sensitivity to sounds and challenges that would make it difficult for him to find a job as he got older. So Steve took action. He bought a popcorn shop at the local mall and put his son to work. Everyone loves popcorn. It cuts through all social economic barriers. It's, it's not um, seasonal and it's not dangerous to make. When you found out your dad had bought this popcorn shop, what did you think? I didn't expect it to get like this far. <laughs> Within a year, that small idea turned into Popcorn for the People, a nonprofit organization that employs autistic adults. We, we create opportunities, we create jobs, we are, and we are an equal opportunity company. <laughs> Each employee is assigned a task, from labeling packages with personalized stickers. No, this bag was labeled by Patrick. 
to popping the kernels. Right over here, you have the popping machines. And even breaking apart Oreos for their signature cookies and cream flavored popcorn. You do it all by hand? Yep. Now use a mallet to smash up the Oreos. The idea here is to keep machines out and people employed. I would rather have two or three autistic workers working at a spot as opposed to having some fancy machine that will crank it up by itself and three people lose their jobs. The company has more than 30 employees on payroll. Their ages range from 21 to 56, and there's even a wait list. You have roughly 40 employees or potential employees on a wait list trying to get into this place. What does that say about the employment market? I think that speaks volumes. For many of them, this is their first job ever. It's devastating the lack of employment in the, in the autism community. The unemployment rate for autistic adults is more than 80%. Why is it that high, though? The public has to understand behaviors that they may interpret one way can mean something completely different with someone who's on the autism spectrum. So like Sam, right? You like to every now and then maybe to walk outside, maybe kind of jump around a bit, right? Calm yourself down a little. If you're not aware of that and understand what that means, sure. you think I'm not gonna hire that guy. Sam, what, what would you say to, to people who might be thinking, I don't know, I know it's hiring an adult with autism, that's, that's, that's too much of a risk. A lot of these kids with autism, you know, they may act funny, they may seem strange, but some reason, like the majority of them are smart at one thing. For example, like a severely like autistic kid may not be able to speak, but if you give them like a mixed up Rubik's Cube, they can solve it within like less than a minute. 25 year old Patrick Wimmer joined Popcorn for the People four years ago. Before starting, he wouldn't leave his mom's side. Now, he's one of the company's star employees. You're a master popper. Yep, I know I am. In a, in a given day, how much popcorn do you think you probably pop? 22 batches of popcorn. Patrick's mom says popcorn for the people has made her son more independent. He loves coming here. For me, it was the best feeling in the world. I think it's what every parent wants when your child grows up. You want them to have a job, and he has one now. For families like Patrick's, the business has changed their lives. And Steve hopes the popcorn will keep on popping. But if dad's not up for the task, there's somebody ready to step in. I mean, Sam, I, dad can't do it forever. Do you think at some point you take over the popcorn and Oh, pop I will. I will. It sounds like you're ready. Sounds like you could do it today. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got a protege. From one father-son duo to the next, Craig also spoke to a superhero dad who's gone to amazing lengths to show his love for his young son. Take a look. Oh, oh you got me, Jake Jet Pulse. Dad? Professional comic book artist Led Bradshaw's son Jake was just three and a half years old when he was diagnosed with autism. Help! What did you know about autism? Um, I really didn't know anything. The diagnosis led me to do a lot of, uh, a lot of research. Through that research, Led discovered art therapy exercises that he started incorporating into his son's daily routines. And then one of the, uh, the, the projects was envision yourself as a superhero. He started drawing himself as this character, and it was all that he wanted to talk about. And it, it would seem as if the apple didn't fall far from the tree because you were quite the comic book kid too. And I guess you could see behind me, it's like I never let that go. I knew what I wanted to do ever since I was little. Like all I wanted to do was draw Saturday morning cartoons. No, Walking Dead and Night of the Living Dead are two different things. Led and Jake started nerding out over everything comic related they could get their hands on. and. They soon found themselves collaborating on their first original father-son comic book, Jake Jet Pulse. How did that first Jake Jet Pulse book come to be? Jake was in the second grade, and it was a parent-teacher's conference about his ability to remember like sight words and spelling. The whole idea came about when I asked the teacher, I was like, well, can I have a list of the sight words the kids are learning? Out of that list, led began creating flashcards for his son. On them, he drew pictures of a superhero in Jake's likeness, acting out the vocabulary words. Jake flying, Jake, you know, running real fast. So he learned the words run, jump. So what kind of color hair would he have? He would have blue hair. What's his role now? 
He's involved in almost every part of it, creating the characters, envisioning like the backstory. He sits at my side while I'm putting it all together so I get his stamp of approval. Like that? Uh -huh. There you go. I should hire you. So sometimes I'll say, Dad, that that's that's actually not that's that's not my vision. We need to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, sometimes like I like to lend my creative input, but I you know I just give in. You know, there's no point <laughs> in arguing. <laughs> what has this meant for for him emotionally, intellectually, being this involved uh, in a project like this? His vocabulary started to build. He became more confident. It's like being a superhero. He started to emulate the the, the character also. Even though it's a collaborative thing, it's more like a like a love letter to my son, where I can actually teach him how to be a good human being. You know, like to not give up, to work your hardest, to do your best. In addition to raising awareness about autism through the character of Jake Jet Pulse, Led also created a website to help educate people about autism spectrum disorder and foster a sense of community for parents. As a parent, I wanted to create something to show people that you're not alone. This does not define who their children will be. There are amazing and exceptional individuals who are on the autism spectrum. I wanted to create something that gives people hope. A feeling of hope, strength, and confidence that has surely rubbed off on his son, Jake. Jake, do you have a favorite comic book character? Yes, and that's me. <laughs> Mine too, Jake Jet Pulse. I'm a big fan. Can I ask you about autism? If you're diagnosed with autism, that's not bad. It's okay. You're still unique and you can do anything. We're back here on The Boost and our spotlight on autism. Harry Smith introduces us to one man with a disorder who's found his place in the world, center stage. It took a while for him to realize, but for most of his life, Mickey Rowe has been an actor in search of a role. So I had to street perform to make money because uh, no one else really wanted to hire me, but right. I figured I could hire myself. Yeah. So I would stilt walk all over here at Pike Place Market. Get out. Twisting balloons for kids. Yeah. Or juggling knives. <laughs> and, Seriously? Mm hmm And that's what I had to do with a hat out uh, to make money. As a person with autism, Roe has long sought to fit in. To him, the neurotypical world felt foreign, often frightening, but not if he put on a costume. It is a way to get people's attention. And I think what I loved so much about it is, as an autistic person my whole life, people have often felt really uncomfortable around me. But whenever I was street performing here, 
everyone who saw me smiled. In his book, Fearlessly Different, Roe writes of his difficult childhood, of his struggles in school, until a visit to the Seattle Children's Theater. As an autistic person, I didn't get a lot of social interaction in my life. I all of a sudden got to experience all these really incredible, wonderful social interactions in a safe way. Turns out, the play is the thing. On stage, everything is scripted, predictable. Rowe immersed himself in the Seattle theater scene, but as an adult, he found there were no parts. A local casting director told him about the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime the much-celebrated, award-winning book and play. And that she felt the main character in this play and in this book was me. So she thought it would be really important for me to read the book and see a story about someone who was, she felt was like me. So what'd you do? I was trying to figure out how I could get an audition for this play in New York City when I lived in Seattle. I had no agent. In desperation, Mickey sent an email to the Broadway show. Improbably, it got him not one, but two auditions. He did not get a part. My hopes were completely dashed, and I did. I thought that it was all for nothing. But that dog in the nighttime refused to disappear. Two regional theaters, one in Indiana, one in Syracuse, offered Mickey the part of his dreams. I'm writing a story about who killed Mrs. She's dog. He won raves. I mean, we should all feel that we are wanted places because communities feel like we are an asset, not a liability. And this was the first time that I was truly embraced as an asset, not a liability. Yeah, you want to help me peel it too? Me peel it. Married in a blended family with four children, Mickey is remarkable. Whoa. For his determination, yes, but especially for his message to all of us. I think so often people want so badly to fit in that they forget what makes them stand out. So I really, really hoped that my book would help people to feel brave enough to stand out. Thank you. For Sunday Today, Harry Smith, Seattle. One more video sure to leave you with a smile on your face. Check it out. This is a beautiful one. It's one of those beautiful Cinderella stories. It's emerging from the Masters Tournament. So a 23-year-old amateur, his name is Sam Bennett, stole the show. He finished the first round at four under par. This guy is tied for sixth place. Spot we saw Cameron Young. Birdie from. Can Bennett do the same? Yes. Yes. What a start for the amateur. All right, Sam Bennett, not one single bogey yesterday, which is really impressive. He did have two birdies. He had an eagle. Sam Bennett is playing to honor his late father, who died in 2021. He had early onset Alzheimer's. His dad wrote something down, last bit of advice to his son, and he's, it was this don't wait to do something. So Bennett took that note, those words, tattooed those above his left wrist. Wow. 
exactly as his father had written them, and he carries those inspirational words with him every single time. That's it for today. We hope we were able to start your morning off with a little positivity, and we'll see you right here tomorrow with more of The Boost on Today All Day. there. Welcome to Start Today. So spring is here. The sun's out. Weather's just right. The perfect time to kick off another month with our Start Today community. Over 130,000 of us have joined that Facebook group and we are growing every month. So scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen and become part of the 430,000 folks who have subscribed to our newsletter. On this episode, we're going to share everything you'll need to feel empowered through your fitness journey, from inspiring conversations with our community members to workouts we can all do at home. Plus, we're going to give you tips on how to add more nutrition to your favorite meals. This is Start Today. First up, there's no better way to keep the momentum going than with our monthly walking challenge. A member of our Start Today community, join me to kick off April's challenge and share how fitness has changed her life. Walking literally saved the life of one of our members who hasn't looked back since joining our challenge. We're going to talk to Pamela Wampler in just a moment. But first, NBC's Kristen Dahlgren has her story. Kristen? Hey, good morning. 140,000 of you have now joined us to lead healthier lives. For Pamela, it was exactly what she needed to transform her life by putting down the wine and picking up walking. Pamela Wampler started to drink socially at around 40. Just to kind of hang out with my friends. It was just a time to kind of get together and have a good time. A busy mom to two boys, the wine seemed to help her unwind. I realized I just need a glass of wine to settle myself down. So I felt like I could be relaxed enough to help them do their homework. Soon one glass turned into two. At what point did you realize it was a problem? I don't know, honestly, when it started a year ago, it was up to about two bottles a night. It was when I'm happy, I need a glass. When I'm sad, I need a glass. It was the first thing I thought of that I needed to reach to. But as she downed those glasses, Pamela noticed her weight creeping up. And how much weight did you gain? Probably over the last three, four years, I had gained 70 pounds. She couldn't do the things she enjoyed, like surfing with her family. I couldn't fit in my wetsuit anymore, and it was very embarrassing. But it was more than embarrassment. Pamela's doctor was concerned. My doctor had told me that I was at the beginning stages of liver failure. She was told she wouldn't be considered for a liver transplant because she was an alcoholic. I was thinking, I'm just a mom who drinks wine. How in the world could I be an alcoholic? The doctor gave me a choice. It's wine or your life. Even then, Pamela didn't want to give it up until one day she almost went too far. I went out drinking with friends and I was ready to get in my car and drive. And I can't believe I was willing to do it. And it scared me on a mission to improve their health. We've got fitness trainer Stephanie Mansoor. It was then she saw a segment on the Today Show that would change her life. They were talking about Start Today, and I thought, this is what I need. She joined the Facebook group. And I thought, OK, I'm just going to share little bits. And even about my sobriety and the words of encouragement that I got just kind of helped me. Instead of reaching for that glass of wine, Pamela and her husband began to walk. At first, not far. So it started with that walk around the block. How much are you walking now? We walk about three to three and a half miles a day. She also hasn't had a glass of wine. How much weight have you lost? As of today, 53 pounds. Now she walks in 5Ks and added in an exercise bike. Now Pamela is the inspiration for others wanting to start today to live a healthier life. I mean, I was on the verge of liver failure, and now it's like I can't wait to get out there every single day and walk. It's, I thrive on it. This is such a special community with thousands of people posting their victories, their encouragement on the Start Today Facebook page. And Pamela says that was really a key to her success, guys. Oh, thanks, mm -hmm. Kristen. And we, we also want to mention you can join the Start Today community by scanning our QR code. We're going to have a little bit more on that in just a moment. But right now we are so happy because we have Pamela with us. 
What an inspiring story. Mm. Wow. I think everyone has their moment that you can put your finger on when everything's going to change. Will you remind us about that moment where you turned on the show and you saw this thing and you decided, like, it's kind of now or never? I mean, it's crazy. It's just I, I realized that this is the time I need to do this. This is the time that I need to change my life and I need to live a healthier time. You had to hit rock bottom, it sounds like, because I think a lot of people go down a slope, but yep. you don't hit bottom, but you had to hit bottom with that uh, when you were almost about to go drinking and driving. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. And then you decided, I mean, which I think is really brave, you shared this on our Facebook page. What made you decide to do that? I think just reading other people's posts and they were sharing their struggles and their triumphs and I felt safe. I didn't know these people. And I think just not knowing these people mm. kind of made it safe for me to want to share. Well, you know, it's so weird because on social media, there are so few places where if you post something, you don't get bombarded with meanies yeah. just because of the way life is. But this is, this is a safe place. Mm -hmm. Now, to go from where you were on day one to where you are today, you said you've dropped 53 pounds, you feel better. How has that process been for you? It's been fantastic. It's mm -hmm. like, I feel more powerful. I feel better about myself. I feel like I can get up in the morning and conquer um, just life. I mm -hmm. feel better. You have, a, yeah. you have that look. <laughs> and, and, and I know uh, Stephanie Mansour is part of our walk today. Yeah. She's our leader. So mm -hmm. we thought that she really would like to meet you. Yeah. So Steph, come on out. <laughs> no way. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Congratulations, Pamela. I'm oh my so gosh. proud of you. Thank you. Yes. That's awesome. Yes. Steph, Yay. why do you think Pamela's story is so yeah. inspirational? You know, we can all relate to Pamela's story, guys, because we all have an unhealthy habit or two that we're looking to kick to the curb. And Pamela's just happened to be, you know, going for that glass of wine after work. Some of us go home and we're looking forward to raiding the cupboards and getting our junk food or ordering delivery. Mm -hmm. But instead of just, you know, kicking that habit to the curb, Pamela picked up a healthier habit. And it's what I like to call a transition walk. You yeah. transitioned from your chaotic, stressful day into a healthier, happier, more relaxing mm -hmm. evening that you're proud of. And it helps you reach your goals. So I think we can all relate to that. Not only kicking the habit, but also mm -hmm. replacing it with a healthier right. one. Let's continue the fun. Here's some more from our kickoff event for this month. You know, today is World Party Day, so oh. we're celebrating with another start oh. to walking monthly walking challenge. All you got to do is scan that <laughs> QR code on your screen to sign up for the Today April Start Today newsletter with our monthly workout. Today, fitness contributor Stephanie Mansour is here with one of our Start Today members, Pamela Wampler. Pamela is inspiring all of us to live a healthier life. Earlier, she shared her sobriety journey, and Pamela's husband, Brent, is here with us as well. Good morning to all of you guys. I'm Good so morning. happy you're all here Thank this you. morning. <laughs> so Stephanie, Pamela um, shared, I, I should say, some very inspiring story earlier. She didn't know that she'd get to meet her. <laughs> and so now we're working out together. Kind of surreal, huh? What a day. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so in, in addition to walking, we're going to add mm -hmm. some resistance to our journey this yes. month, right? So we've got an easy way that you can really add strength training to your walking program. Okay. And that's by using these resistance bands. So we're going to start oh, off what with is, what the oh, it's a party, it's party day. day. It's party day. Oh. That's right. Yeah. So <laughs> instead of, you know, great. reaching for that cocktail okay. or, you know, a traditional party, I want you to look at your workout as a party. You okay. know, like before I became a trainer, and a coach, I dreaded exercise. And yeah. it wasn't until I changed that mindset and really thought, oh my gosh, this is fun. I'm going to smile. I'm going to have a great time. So our first exercise here is stepping on the band. So we're going to step on the band with the feet about um, as wide as the hips, and we're going to do a bicep curl. So elbows hug in, we curl up, we repeat this exercise 10 times, and then we move on to the next exercise. Okay. And this is really effective because we're strengthening and toning and getting those arms much more in shape for the spring and summer and then the next exercise we do is for the upper back so anyone that's got posture issues mm -hmm. or even shoulder pain this is mm -hmm. great to strengthen the upper back abs in feet are staggered we're gonna open the arms out to the sides Ooh, good that looks that great straight. yes straight arms and lower down oh, and just yeah. lean forward a little bit at a 45 degree mm -hmm. angle yes that's great so Exhale. this is a circuit that you would be doing yes Steph? this is a circuit exactly Al so we repeat each exercise 10 times Steph, and move we, to the next do we hold at the top no nope, you can just lower it back 
yeah. down. And that's the I thing actually, Craig, it. I love about resistance bands is we get that tension on the way up and down on the, the way, way down. And you can, you can get them uh, for different resistances. Exactly. So I got us the light version with the handles, but we're going to move on to these, um, what we call kind of booty bands. Booty now, band. we've oh, got booty light. Band. We've uh -huh. got light, but Craig has heavy. He brought his own. You want it heavy? <laughs> well, there's a little more booty there. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. we got to work it out extra hard. So we're going to step into the bands okay. here. And if you can't do this at home or if this seems like it's going to be too much balance, mm -hmm. you can do these exercises without right. the band. Okay. So we're going to start with the feet as wide as the hips, abs in, working the lower body now. And we're going to tap one foot out to Not the side, so working that outer hip. Nice. And then bring it back to center. Tap out and center. Keep going a little bit faster. Out and center. Oh, what is this doing for us, Stephanie? Out and center. We're working the outer oh, hip. That feels good. The thigh. Yes, this is great if you have low back pain. Mm -hmm. This is helping to stabilize and support the core. Right. And then we're going to do a backwards kick. So, same leg. Oh. We're going to reach it back. Try to oh. straighten that leg. Work the glute and the hamstring. Awesome. Yes, good job, Pamela. And then come back to center. Reach what it back. What were you doing over there, oh. And center. Ooh, <laughs> you know what I love about this, Stephanie? The resistance bands don't cost a lot of money. That's uh -huh. right. And you can do it at home. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You can throw expensive. these in your bag if you're yes. traveling. Exactly. Yes. Or really under easy. the couch, but make sure you remember yeah. them and right. step back out. <laughs> right. Coming up, we've got more inspirational stories from our Start Today community members. And then later, we're going to have some quick and easy full body workouts. The best part? You don't even have to go to the gym. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Start Today. Every fitness journey looks a little different, but one thing that helps keep everybody going is inspiration from others. Monica Poole set a goal to change her life after an unexpected wake-up call about her health. She visited the third hour to share her progress with us. But first, let's take a look at her story. My health journey kicked off in January of 2022. The catalyst was when my brother needed a kidney donor and my health prevented me from being a candidate. I was overweight, I had high cholesterol, and I was pre-diabetic. I decided to meet with a nutritionist who suggested the Mediterranean diet might be a sustainable lifestyle change for me. I had been a yo-yo dieter for most of my life. In addition to changing my eating habits and tracking my food for mindful eating, I started walking approximately 7,000 steps throughout the day. I lost 20 pounds by the summer of 2022, but then my weight plateaued. That's when Start Today became part of my journey, giving me the community I needed to keep going. I keep moving all day with additional walking, weightlifting, and my latest endeavor, yoga. Start Today helped me lose an additional 40 pounds. I'm full of energy and I'm more productive at work. When I was overweight, I wanted to fade into the background. Now, I want to be seen. All right, All right well, let's see. Yay. Monica is here with us this morning. Monica, come on out. Yay. All right. Good morning, 
welcome. Good morning. We're so happy for you. Thanks for Thank coming you. in. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. I gotta give you a hug. Oh please, absolutely. Come on I'm in. Watching Bring you it in. forever. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> see you. Myself at home. Yeah, thank for, you. So, so much. first of all, before we, we we get into your story, how's your brother doing? Well, um, he's still waiting. He's on the kidney list. Mm -hmm. He's O positive. So if you don't, if you know anything about kidney kidney mm -hmm. donors, that's the longest list. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, his name's Zach Douglas, and I am. You know, we're just all just waiting. Mm -hmm. Just waiting. Yeah. Yeah. He's, yeah. And, and did you reach your goal of, of getting healthy enough to become an, uh, a kidney donor? I did. Um, I worked with um, Cleveland Clinic Florida, okay. and they were excellent as far as educating me on what I needed to do to be healthy as a kidney donor, mm -hmm. as well as um, staying healthy for the rest of my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was really the aha moment, yeah. because with yo-yo dieting, I was always focused on just losing the weight. Right. And um, Cleveland Clinic Florida really just drilled it in that this is a lifetime commitment. Right. But unfortunately, they found an underlying health issue I had oh. that I wasn't even aware of, hmm. so it. I was denied. Well, but on the upside, you know now. But so. it yeah. changed my life, yeah. so it was kind of ironic yes. that I started this journey to give to others, and he, you know, the, the journey actually gave to me yeah. and changed my life. That's great. What do you think were the, the biggest reasons that you, you struggled before this, this journey? I, I really think it was um, a perspective. I was like, oh, you know, I, I just have to lose the weight. It's all about the diet. It's all about the scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and this round, I was like, no, it's all about, it's all within my control. Right. Mm. Um, they recommended the Mediterranean diet, which I found to be very easy to follow. Mm -hmm. um, I also tracked what I ate, so it was mindful eating. Um, and I took steps, I had this goal, but I focused on the daily steps yeah. mm -hmm. the, um, that actually um, made the difference. So yeah. now it's not about the scale, it's, it just magic happens. When you focus on what you can do every mm -hmm. day that's within your control, the magic happens mm. and it's still happening. Yeah. So we're coming up on vacation season, spring break, then summer vacations. So how do you maintain, you know, this, the regiment that you have now when you're traveling, when you're, you know, do you have yep. cheat days? I mean, how do you make it work? Well, it's, it's hard when you travel, but I just went on a cruise with my family, uh, my brother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and we just kept walking in the morning. Mm -hmm. And Start Today is actually really in inspirational because every day you see people walking. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm happy to report I didn't gain a single pound back. Wow. wow. And, on a know, cruise? I'm, that's a yeah, feat. That's yeah. amazing. That's a feat. <laughs> and um, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't perfect, but that's the other thing. This yeah. is the lifestyle. Still vacation, yeah. too. You yeah. want to enjoy your life. And, right. And, and really quickly, yes. Monica, because a lot of folks, it's it's taking that first, it's starting today. What, what you, for folks who are trying to think, they're just so overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. What's your one takeaway? Focus on what you can do today. Have a goal, an eating goal, and a moving goal. Um, for the eating goal, focus on fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Get more in your diet. Um, for the moving goal, just start moving. And when I first started, I would take 10 minutes here, mm -hmm. 10 minutes there. Yeah. I would break it up through the day. I mean, now I, I walk an hour and a half every yeah. morning, and it's nothing. Um, but it took me a year to get sure. there. Mm -hmm. wow. So and you um, did get there. That's the yeah. That's, that's the, the takeaway. And this past weekend, we walked 20 miles here in New oh York City. Oh my goodness! Wow. <laughs> Good well, Monica, thank you. You're an inspiration. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to sign up for the Start Today newsletter, scan the QR code right there on your screen. Up next, we're going to show you some strength exercises to help build some muscle. You don't even have to leave your house. Plus, want to enjoy your favorite meals without the guilt? We've got tips and tricks to sneak in more nutrition. We're back right after this.
And we're back and starting the month off strong. We got celebrity trainer Ben Bruno recently showing us how some muscle building exercises. And when you take these, you don't even have to go to the gym. You just grab some stuff around the house and start working out. Ben, hey, welcome back. Thanks for having me. You're We're back. so excited to have you here. And I, I love this strength workout. I don't love cardio, but I feel like you can, there's we'll a lot along. of benefit. I don't like it either. That's good to hear. So you can still be in well, shape without doing cardio. Full body strength training is a cheat code because it's strength training and cardio at the same time. Okay. okay. All right. So we, we actually don't do a lot of traditional, I call it gerbil cardio on the machines. Mm -hmm. we, like do, we usually do weights. And this okay. is stuff you can do at home. Yeah, it's, it's just full body strength training. We should, let's just let's do get it. right okay. in there. But I want to show you guys four moves for a full body workout. Okay. okay. For the first, you actually don't need weights, but let's step up. We're going to do a reverse lunge, okay. mm -hmm. hands at the hips, and step back like this okay. in alternating fashion. Mm -hmm. This is actually a lot easier on your knees than lunging forward. Yeah. So but that's a good tip for you. What's the benefit of going backwards? Going backwards works your butt more and it's oh, easier on the knees. Things. But if you want to add weights, you could use dumbbells or mm -hmm. you could just use anything around your house, like oh. even. A gallon of milk. You know, a gallon, gallon of milk. Uh -huh. and do okay. what with it? But Ben, I feel like some, from, for some, some folks who do this at home, when the knee goes over, it when it goes when it goes over your, you, your it foot, it can go over a little, but it shouldn't be excessive. And so okay. the way to correct that is to make sure that you're stepping far enough back. Ah. A short stride makes the knee go forward. Okay. You, I saw this. You did this with Kate Upton. I like. Yeah, yeah. All well, of your she clients hold, she look holds amazing. her daughter, but I'm not there yet. So I'm right now. I'm with milk. <laughs> milk look at that. Milk's actually kids. Oh, I thought you were kidding. No, oh, there she is. Kidding. No, no, no. She is. Uh, That's crazy. Yeah. For all my that. LA people, this is. Uh, not dairy milk. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, it's like milk. Milk. Okay. It's like hip <laughs> milk or something. Uh, so now we've got our reverse lunges going. Let's take so a So now step we're going to do what's called a, a lunge matrix. So okay. this kills a lot of birds with one stone. It's th one exercise, but it's actually three exercises. Okay. okay. You're going to do a reverse oh. lunge, mm -hmm. step forward into a forward lunge, mm -hmm. then step to the side. Yeah, I'm not Ooh. doing So this is thighs, glutes, you don't have to. <laughs> so, yeah. You did so good on the next one. So what this is, uh, back. Mm -hmm. Forward, forward and then side like Back, that. Forward, side. And so you know me, I'm going to brag on you because you do this with Jessica Biel. I did, yeah. You, Jess does this way better Back. than I do. Mm -hmm. We, we have video of that one too. Yeah. Oh, we do. Jess should wow. probably train me. She and <laughs> and she and I do the same workouts, but I look like this. Wait, so I was just results say. may vary. There you go. <laughs> they may vary, but you're going to go here, here. How and many here. times? Four each direction, but that's okay. actually like 12. This will jack you. When you talk yeah, about cardio, it yeah. jacks your heart rate up. Okay, okay so what about strengthening upper body and core? Okay. Yeah, enough legs, right? That's yeah, why God invented legs. pants. So now what we're going to do, <laughs> stand up like this, uh -huh. hand out to the side, and press straight up, keeping what's called a neutral grip. So okay. here, not here. That's easier on the shoulders. Okay. This hand goes out to the side to make a fist. Uh -huh. This is called a radiation, which is just a nerdy way of saying you're working your core. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, okay. So you're going to go just it. like that. How many of these do you do, Ben? Uh, about eight to ten each side uh -huh. and switch. Okay. Can I tell you something? Okay. I've never done that move. Like, you I've know, never sometimes we see. When right. the weight gets heavy, you'll actually feel like crazy in your abs. I want to get yeah. to the last That's a good little no. work. That's a good okay. little To cap off the full body workout, we're going to okay. do something for your back. It's called a split stance row. Okay. okay. Get nice wide like this, put your mm -hmm. hand out to the side, make a fist. Mm -hmm. And then row right one. in like this. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking about pulling to your hip, not up high. You don't want to shrug. So your shoulder should be as far away from your ear as you can. And pulling right here. We, we, we call this with my female clients, the technical term is the tricky spot. It the works tricky the tricky spot. spot. That tricky spot. That so oh, that's go great. Like that. So you, this six-week program, are these things we would do every day or? Three times a week. No, I don't, I don't oh, think you wow. should need to give your life over to the gym. It's three times a week, 45 minutes. Not bad. Like yeah, it's good. Think. It's, it's pretty like doable. Your whole, nice. you know, your whole process. And it works, clearly. And we're just getting warmed up because up next, we're going to share how to add more nutrition to your favorite meals so we can all enjoy everything from mashed potatoes to tacos without the guilt. We'll be right back.
we're back with more Start Today. Now, we all know eating healthy is important, but it sometimes can feel like a chore. Should we avoid carbs? Is red meat good or bad? Well, we've got you covered. Today, nutrition and health expert Joy Bauer stopped by the third hour to show us how to enjoy more of our favorite guilty pleasures. Okay, this is I a fantastic that. idea. Yes. Yeah. Yeah poofing up the volume of a lot of foods that we already love to eat okay. and we're boosting the nutrition as well. So, so it's what did a you win -win. do with these potatoes? So this is a cup of traditional mashed potatoes, okay. pure comfort food. Mm -hmm. You could have for the same calories double the portion by doing this trick. Basically what this I is do really is too. I is. mix cauliflower together oh, with spuds oh. and you just Boil it up. There it is, right in the pot, and then you drain it you and you mash don't even it. You taste the difference. Mm -hmm. You you I actually think that tastes better than regular potatoes. I do potatoes. too. How many? How many what's the ratio for potatoes? So and so it, you could have two. Oh, so half and half. half so and you half? do fifty fifty. So you could basically do it for wow. any recipe. And then I add in a little bit of milk, some garlic, salt, mm. and pepper. But and you left the skins on. And I left the mm. skins on because you get extra fiber. And the mm. great thing about the cauliflower is it's part of the cruciferous vegetable family. Mm -hmm. So it has common Compounds called glucosinolates, mm. which have been shown to reduce the risk of certain cancers. That's genius. Wow. Mm. So this Great for kids, right. too, by the way. Mm. They'll never know. Never know. <laughs> Yum. Okay, what about this next one? So, this next one is all this about like seasoned taco meat. So, that's what this we is right this here. Night. Yes. Tex Mex Tuesday. All you do, same skillet, same taco meat, a pound and a pound, you open up a can of black beans, rinse it, drain it, and pour it right in. Now what you've done is you've increased the volume, mm -hmm. you've added plant-based protein, and fiber in yeah. taco filling, That's which is smart. great. That's I love great. that. Yeah. It fills it up. I love black beans. Ooh, grab my okay, Pasta. So this next one, yes. Yeah, like okay, I love this one. It's something I do in the house all the time. Okay. Do you love a great big bowl of pasta? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this is one cup of penne. This is one cup of penne with an equal one cup of vegetables in it. Wow, it's so, just mixed right in. Yeah, you get a great big bowl of pasta, plus you get the antioxidants, the vitamins, the minerals, and you get color. Yeah. So it yeah. gives it a nice presentation. And I did broccoli, but honestly, you could do any I vegetable throw peas under the into sun. I pasta whenever I make it. My and kids leftovers. are always like, peas again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, just I love peas, peas. And everything. Trail mix. Okay. So trail mix is so darn healthy for you, but yeah. if you look on the label, mm -hmm. a serving it's size. A lot. It's a quarter it's of a cup. Yeah. It's so teeny. So all you do is you add one mm. to two handfuls of light popcorn to it, puffs the volume, you you increase your eating experience, and it also adds a nice sort of crispy it's a great texture. Idea. Yeah, I love this also one. Also okay. great for kids. Green also good for kids. Good for kids. Yeah. Okay. Um, we the, promised ice cream. Ice cream. So all this right. is a wait. So this is three quarters of a cup okay. of ice cream. You know, it's delicious, but it's measly. So this is how you trick your eyes into thinking it's a great big mm -hmm. dessert. Mm -hmm. I add three quarters cup of mixed berries Actually, to the bottom, really good. then the ice cream on top. And not only do you get a bigger volume mm -hmm. look, but you also get the anti antioxidants, they're called anto anthocyanins, mm -hmm. in these berries, which give your heart a hug mm -hmm. and it boosts brain power as well. You could also sort of take like, like a, a big thing of whipped cream. Uh, and put yes, that on that's top. not part of it. <laughs> that doesn't count you for much. You know what? I love whipped cream. Right? And the aerated whipped cream is so it's like light. Free. It's very, yeah. very light. These are yeah. great. doable things. To yeah, get some these I are like great. this with the And so we get to eat more and we get more nutrition. Yeah, where to go, Joy Bauer? That's all for this edition of Start Today. Don't forget, scan that QR code and sign up for the Start Today newsletter. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next time. This is crazy. Yeah. This is like, it's like a, the best floral arrangement I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I'm Sama Dada. I'm a cookbook author and recipe developer in the plant-based food scene, which is becoming more innovative every day. I'm on a mission to see how startups, restaurants, and chefs are changing the way we see and eat plants. And I can't wait to show you how to bring more delicious dishes into your kitchen. I love mushrooms. I mean, I really, really love mushrooms. They are an essential part of a plant-based lifestyle because they're such an easy swap for me. But I've got lots of questions about fungi. How do they grow? Where do they grow? And which types 
have the most unique texture. I'm gonna learn all about their culinary range with chef and mushroom enthusiast, my friend, Sophia Rowe. Then I'll travel to Colorado to see how mushroom roots are being transformed into a hearty new protein. But first, I wanna learn some basics. So, I'm heading out to Smallholds, an innovative farm in Brooklyn, New York. Let's go. When you think about mushrooms, you probably think of those capped little fungi. But there are literally thousands of edible mushrooms out there. And no, I'm not talking about that kind of mushroom. A lot of people think that they don't like mushrooms because they're used to eating the same mushroom. And they think all mushrooms are the same, but they're not. It's like saying you don't like mushrooms is like saying you don't like plants. Um, like, a, like the differences between a trumpet and an oyster and a button mushroom, it's like saying like an almond tree versus a head of lettuce. Um, and an apple, you know, they're very different. <laughs> Andrew Carter and Adam DiMartino founded Smallholds, an organic mushroom farm in 2017. They share a passion for rare mushroom varieties and want to bring those tastes and textures to more people. There's a whole kingdom out there and everyone's used to eating the same mushroom. A white and a brown mushroom and a portobello mushroom, they're all the same mushroom. That's right, white button, cremini, and portobello are all the same type of mushroom. Their scientific name is agaricus, if you want to be fancy about it. The industry grows those because that's what they're used to growing. Consumers are used to consuming those. You can look at other regions, like if you go to China or Japan or Korea, the mushroom industry is way more advanced than it is here. It's so like consumers in certain regions are eating 10 to 20 times as much mushrooms as people are in the United States. So what were your first steps to starting Smallhold? The early beginning was uh, building out a lab in a basement at a house, and it looked crazy. Andrew and Adam started experimenting with trumpet mushrooms. After perfecting the process, they expanded to shiitake and oyster. In just five years, that basement startup moved into a shipping container, then to their first farm in Brooklyn. The company has grown rapidly with funds from dozens of investors and a soaring demand for mushrooms. Over the last few years is that people really started getting interested in food as medicine, trying to eat less meat, trying to be sustainable, trying to eat local. All of these things ended up just kind of centering around mushrooms. In 2020, organic mushroom sales grew by 20%. Feeding that demand, Smallhold now grows 15 different types of mushrooms, producing a whopping 1.5 million pounds each year for hundreds of grocery stores and restaurants. Mushrooms are grown by a process called inoculation. A spore is placed deep inside a substrate, like a log. The spores germinate, then feed on the wood, growing into mycelium, or mushroom roots. This fruiting body is probably like four, four days, four or five days old. It takes about four weeks for the roots to be fully grown. That's when cute baby mushrooms called pins start to appear on the surface. In about a week, they're ready to harvest. Fungi are its own kingdom. They're functionally more similar to animals than they are like plants. They breathe in oxygen, they release CO2, they digest stuff, they don't go through photosynthesis and so their interaction with the environment is just so different than plants. Traditional mushroom farms cultivate their fungi in mulch with a mix of hay, straw, and corn cob. But Smallhold is focused on growing in urban areas to make the entire operation more sustainable. City farms might seem strange, but fungi don't require a lot of light, water, or space to thrive. Our mushrooms, we grow, they're called saprotrophic mushrooms, and so they're wood-loving mushrooms. They digest wood. All of the substrates that we're using, that's the stuff that's inside of this block. About 90% of it is sawdust. Smallhold's mushrooms are grown in bags filled with a compound from mills and factories, so they're reusing a byproduct from the timber industry. And those futuristic containers don't just look cool. And so these chambers themselves have really intricate controls over all the climate that they're exposed to. That allows them to forego pesticides. Plus, the fragile mushrooms aren't susceptible to extreme weather. Can you walk me through the environmental impact of growing mushrooms? It's one of the most sustainable products you can probably find in the grocery store. We did a big life cycle analysis, which is a large like, third-party analysis to understand exactly what's going on with your company. Our carbon impact was about 30% less than any other mushroom farm we could find. 
Over 60% of the country's mushrooms are grown in one Pennsylvania county, which means it takes a lot of fuel to ship them across the country. So a lot of mushrooms are actually imported from overseas. And so the carbon footprint of those is really crazy. Smallholds mushrooms are grown in Brooklyn, Los Angeles, and Austin, Texas. They also operate over a dozen mini farms, custom built tanks that can grow mushrooms inside restaurants and grocery stores. With farms in strategically placed cities, Smallhold plans to reduce carbon emissions by continuing to ship locally. When you're buying a product from Smallhold, like a fresh mushroom in a grocery store, it was grown close to there. And so we have a national brand, like you can be from New York and go to LA and recognize Smallhold on the shelf, but those mushrooms were grown in LA. Most mushrooms also have a naturally meaty texture, which makes them a great vegetarian swap. The more people eat these products, generally speaking, they're eating less meat, whether they realize it or not. And so every time we get someone to eat a little less beef or a little less chicken, then we think that we have a larger impact on the planet because it's less carbon intensive, less water intensive. Okay, Andrew, we're gonna harvest these mushrooms, which I'm very excited about. Yeah. We have uh, blue oysters, we have lion's mane, yellow oysters, and trumpet mushrooms. Um, but we can start with the blue oyster. Let's do this it. This one's pretty fun because, you know, you can't make any promises, but a lot of the time, you kind of get the whole thing just in one pick. Whoa! Like that. Here you go. Ah. And so, big, <laughs> big blue oyster Wait, mushroom. this is so dense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You uh, <laughs> take a big cluster of mushrooms uh -huh. and you shove like garlic in here, like whatever herbs you want, so thyme and rosemary, but you just kind of like shove it inside the cluster itself. Do you roast the whole thing? And you just roast the whole thing. So let's try the lion's mane. So I would just pick off, pick off one of those. Yeah, there you go. Lion's mane is so beautiful and so unique. And this to me is like the most otherworldly mushroom because it just looks like no other. And when you uh, you can take it apart, it like kind of peels sort of like mozzarella. It's so or, like, crazy. A lot of people use it as like a shellfish replacement. Because um, you can pull it like it's yeah, almost stringy. It. Next, we harvested yellow oyster mushrooms, which were more delicate than their blue cousins. They'd be perfect in a creamy soup. But even Andrew has a favorite fungi. I love trumpets so much, and so if you cut it, uh, this isn't the best knife skills, but you can cut them like this, and then you can have a nice scallop. Yeah. These are probably the most popular for people who are trying to like imitate meat with a whole mushroom. And so the other mushrooms can give you the texture and the flavor and the nutrition and all that kind of stuff, but these can like really stand in as a fake scallop or a fake bacon. Why do you want people to eat more mushrooms? I mean, they're, they're great for you. There's a lot of nutrition. They're high in fiber. They have amazing antioxidants. They have vitamin D. And what I really like about them is that they have that umami and that experience that replaces meat. I already eat a lot of mushrooms, but I'm convinced now.
Small Hold got me excited to try something with my new favorite fungi. So I invited mushroom enthusiast, James Beard award-winning chef, my friend Sophia Rowe to my kitchen. Hi! My friend, Sophia, I told you this before, that we are talking about mushrooms, and I was like, listen, I can't do this without Sophia. Talk to me about the role that mushrooms play in your work and in your world. I went to culinary school, and I was sort of kind of playing in that plant-based world, and I felt like fungi and mushrooms were a really great way to encourage a lot of depth, which I feel like in plant-based cooking, sometimes you kind of lose, you know? you Like meat and dairy, those things create a lot of depth. It's pretty remarkable the types of flavors that you can create. And this is not a new idea. They're, particularly in Asian cultures, they've been using different kinds of fungus for forever um, in their cooking. But for me, that was really when I was like, okay, this is sexy. Can you just talk to me about how you work with them? It's almost about like, what am I trying to create? You know, if someone's a very big meat person and they want to go plant-based for a minute or for a meal, I think it's really important to cook things in the same way that you cook meat, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And I don't even know that that's just mushrooms or just fungi, right? A lot of times with steaks, you're braising, you're roasting, you're searing. There's no reason you can't treat plants the same way. I'm, I'm just super excited to know what we're cooking today. Yes. Tell me about the dish and yes. uh, put me to work. All right, so what we have here is lion's mane. When I'm looking for a, a lion's mane, you want them to be kind of fluffy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've been touching this one a lot. You don't want them to be slimy. You don't want them to stink. If they stink or they're slimy, they're no good. And that's kind of the rule, the general rule with any mushroom. Yeah. In terms of washing them, these are commercially cultivated. Mm -hmm. So. They are not wild, these are not feral. So these are not gonna need to be like really, really washed. You just wanna wipe them down, they're good. Do not get your mushrooms wet. You don't <laughs> like it. So this is a good one, this is a great shape. So what okay. we're gonna do is we're basically gonna make like a lion's mushroom steak. And you'll see that I've kind of like, as I'm even talking, I'm kind of pressing this. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like where, just for a second, we're kind of like trying to create like a little steak here, mm. like a little hanger steak. Why okay? are you using lion's mane here, Sophia? I think lion's mane is really delicious, mm. but it's great structure. So it's really great in terms of like replacing meat. If you can't find this, you can cook an oyster mushroom or even a big portobello in exactly the same method. Mm. So the, the key here is you're leaving it nice and whole. Okay. I kind of want to press these down. So I'm just going to score this one side. Okay. And why are you scoring it? So we want the flavor to get in, mm. doggy. We want it to be inside. <laughs> so we're gonna make this glaze. All right, let's so do it. Because we're attempting to make a steak, okay? <laughs> what we wanna do is we wanna help, we wanna help these lines made mushrooms along. Three tablespoons of vegan butter. If you wanna use regular butter, that, that's, that's your you house do and that. do whatever you want. All right, we like, we like it softened like this because we're gonna be whisking it up. We want this to be like glazed texture. Okay. Okay. We also have coconut aminos. It's just like a soy-free soy sauce vibe. <laughs> okay, I also like it because it's a little sweet. Yes, it um, is. And for a glaze, that's really nice. So the sweetness is important because the sweetness is gonna give us caramelization. So grab the sesame. Yes. Get it? Love sesame it. oil. Love it. We love it. You could use toasted if you wanted, but this is just regular old sesame oil. Next up, ingredients to really up the umami factor. Miso, Dijon mustard, and tomato paste. We're gonna just get, some, get a good, like, salt in there right. and then you're just gonna whiskey do dude so this is gonna get I think we have this on medium heat okay okay we have some grapeseed oil here the reason we're using grapeseed is high smoking point we're using cast iron you don't have to use cast iron you can use whatever you have um, so we're going um, score side down. down so what's gonna happen we're yeah gonna put them on we're gonna get a good sear on each side and then we're gonna brush our glaze on okay okay two minutes flip it two minutes then we're gonna take them off and we're gonna let them rest. Just like you would have Just steak. like meat. Just like meat. Crazy. We're gonna treat these just like meat. I love that. This is why we want this hot. Love it. Just drop <laughs> it down. What we can do here, this is like a little like a little tip too. You can mm. always just like just take flatten it down. Yeah, same, same, like same you would do. For I'm sorry, burger. do you have a sound club? <laughs> <laughs> I do now. So just, just, just to kind of encourage again, you want to, yep. want to encourage that flattening, right? Yep. Get it nice and thin, I and that way that. The, 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 the marinade is not having to penetrate so deep. You know how to make a steak, you know how to do these mushrooms. After three minutes, time for a flip. Wait. Look it, look it. Oh. Gorgina. So we're just going to brush this on, <laughs> almost like you're basting a steak or something. Oh, 
Come on, baby. Everything about this feels like you are Van Gogh and I am your apprentice. Oh my God. You, but except you could do this, but you can't the sizzle and the, you know? So what's gonna happen is these are gonna be sitting here, they're gonna be caramelizing, they're gonna be getting juicy. We're gonna take the rest of this glaze and we're gonna baste them a little bit. Ooh. So this is, this. the basting method is never gonna be bad. It's always gonna be good. I mean, look how gorgeous that looks. It's beautiful. It's, I mean, stunning. A few more minutes in the pan. Literally crazy. Uh, crazy, right? It kind of looks like me, too. Uh -huh. These are gonna rest, okay? Okay. It's five minutes. He doesn't need to okay. not Nothing trying to, crazy. Like, nothing wild. As the mushrooms rested, Sophia chopped up some green onions for later. Then it was time to cut into the lion's mane steaks. It's meaty. Can we dog. show them? <laughs> like, they need to know. That looks Everyone really alert. meaty. <laughs> alert. <laughs> but even like, it almost, it's almost like, like you wouldn't really know. It kind of, it just looks like, Mm -hmm. Chicken. Sophia recommends serving the steaks over rice with a few garnishes. First, some sesame seeds, then chili crisp, then scallions. Just like me, Sophia loves a little spice. Come on. Mm. It's so good. Wait, this is. Mm. This is literally the best mushroom dish I've literally ever had. Mm, it's so good. I love it. It is an unfamiliar ingredient mm. cooked in a familiar format. Correct. So I think if you're a beginner, to mushrooms, mm -hmm. a really great thing to do is whatever you can find locally, just try cooking those mushrooms, whatever they are, mm -hmm. in this format. Mm -hmm. Try cooking them this way, yeah. and you're gonna get a completely new relationship to mushrooms. Also, for the people who are like, I hate mushrooms, just give the method a try, mm -hmm. right? I feel like we have to take a photo. Let's do it. Cause like, when have we ever done a little friend cooking sesh? Let's do it. We need to do it. We need a whole photo shoot. We need a, we need a, we need a whole photo shoot. <laughs> I love you, wait, give me a hug. Thank you for coming. Of course. <laughs> Sophia's lion's mane steak looked a lot like chicken, but one company in Colorado is completely transforming mushroom roots into an actual meat substitute. Meat substitutes are everywhere these days, and they're made with a wide variety of ingredients, from whole veggies to soy protein and different oils. Enter Meaty. Here in Boulder, Colorado, mushrooms are the main attraction, and I got an exclusive first look inside their new factory. Meaty isn't trying to replicate ground beef. They're mimicking whole cuts of meat, like steak or chicken breast. It's like a super meat. Yeah, it's a super meat. <laughs> where it has all the protein you would yeah. want for meat. 
with all the fiber and vitamins and minerals you find in plants. Yeah. CEO Tyler Huggins founded Meaty in 2016 after earning his PhD in environmental engineering. Tell me your journey to Meaty and why you started this company. Well, let's we'll start off with, with meat. We, uh, we have a growing population, have a high demand for protein, Meat is, is a growing demand. Given my history uh, studying nature, I knew there was this really cool, magical, root-like structure in the soil. Biologists call it mycelium. We call it mushroom root. Tyler and his team developed a patent-pending process that turned the fuzzy, hair-like mycelium strands into a product that mimics the taste and texture of meat. Unlike mushrooms, you won't find the raw roots in any grocery store. Currently, Meaty sells a steak-like filet and a faux chicken cutlet that's available plain or with a crispy breading. And this is the place where it all comes together. This is it. This is where the magic happens, right here. This is the future of food. The mushroom roots are grown inside these giant tanks. This is this where Meaty is grown, We right? essentially take one spore. Yep. It's like the fungi equivalent of a seed. Okay. We start growing up the mushroom root, and then we throw it into this, into this tank. The tank is filled with water that's packed with nutrients mushroom roots need to thrive. And how long does it take to cultivate and grow and harvest meat? Extremely fast. In this facility, we're able to create the meat equivalent of a whole cow in just four days. So tell me how you replicate the texture of traditional meat. It all starts from the magic of this mushroom root. We grow it in-house in a clean uh, environment, so no exposure to heavy metals or pesticides wow. or herbicides or anything like that. At that state, it kind of looks like uh, applesauce. This is meaty in the raw form before it's processed. And when you form it into a, uh, a chicken breast-like shape or a steak, mm -hmm. those strands become the texture that is very similar. Again, eats just like traditional meat. You can eat it just like that. That's just all natural mushroom meal. I'm gonna you eat know? it. <laughs> okay. It's a blank it's, canvas. It really tastes like, I don't want to say nothing because yeah. there is like a little bit of something, but it is so, like you could throw flavor and spice on that. Including mushroom root, Meaty's Chicken Swap has just four ingredients, salt, natural flavoring, and acacia gum, a fiber used as a food stabilizer. But I had to know, is it healthy? So one of our, our four ounce uh, steak has about 18 grams of protein. And then it has all the fiber and other vitamins and minerals you only find in plants. No cholesterol, no saturated fat, there's no sugar in it. Meaty is now available online, but it often sells out fast, really fast. The company is opening a second farm to meet demand and Meaty will soon be available on supermarket shelves. What is the future of Meaty? We see there's a lot of interest in alternatives to traditional meat. But what we're doing differently is whole food protein, simple ingredient list, super nutritious, and whole cuts. I think that opens up an entirely new demographic, a group of folks who, who are excited to embrace something like this. After hearing so much about these mushroom roots, I wanted to see how it really tasted.
In Boulder, Colorado, the folks behind Meaty are turning mushroom roots into a new meat substitute. At the factory's test kitchen, they're experimenting with the best ways to cook it. I met with Debbie Downing, the company's head research chef, to learn more. I'm so excited to try this. Will you show me how to cook it up? It's the mushroom root, right? Right, right. When you think about cooking mushrooms, it likes to soak up that oil, soak up the sauce. Super porous, yeah. Soak up anything that you give it. So, best practices for our product is that we actually want to add oil to it first. Right. We want to just give a little bit of a drizzle here. Season with salt and pepper, a little oil in the pan, then time for the cutlet. All right, it's ready. Oh, yeah. Sizzles really nicely. The chicken and steak both take about eight minutes to cook. Just like meat, the goal is to develop a nice sear for more flavor. I think it's ready All to right, flip. ready? Yeah. Woo! I just gasped. I haven't eaten chicken in a while. Yeah. I used to, so I know what chicken tastes like. Yeah. But I haven't cooked it in forever. And first of all, this is like very similar in cook. Like when you look at the browning yeah. and the caramelization around the edges, like, did you want to cut it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like kind of freaking it's out food. right now. Into it. I know, I know. Sorry, Tyler. I'm just like, just... I'm processing. I can't get over how much it smells like chicken. And even looking at the texture, I'm going to pick it up and just show you. Oh my God. I just touched it for the first time. Too. It's like the, the texture of it, of animal protein that you would normally see. I feel like it has that. But how? That's the mushroom root, right? The fibers. That's the mycelium. Yeah, gives you that texture and that look. This is not chicken, but it really looks like it. Okay, I'm gonna taste it. Should I taste it? This will be your first time, I'm, like yes. stressed. Yes. Okay. <laughs> is there a mic I can drop? This is like taking me back to when I used to eat chicken, literally. And I'm not just saying this as I'm on camera. Next up, the steak filet. All right, steak. I'm trying it. You need another mic to drop? I need another again. mic to drop. This is insane. Yeah. This tastes like red meat. I haven't had chicken nuggets in years, so I was really excited to try the crispy chicken. This kind of takes me back to days of like growing up and eating fried chicken. chicken this is, am I getting punked? <laughs> Got you. But I wasn't done eating yet. The meaty team had a big surprise for me. Shut up! I'm leaving. <laughs> I see my book. Yep. This is for my book. I didn't know I was going to eat chicken and cry today. My masala mac and cheese and cabbage salad from my cookbook both got the meaty treatment with their chicken. I was so excited. Also on the menu, breakfast tacos and steak in a chimichurri sauce. I even got to try some products in development, a turkey deli meat and beef jerky. They were delicious. This is not gonna be cute. I'm just warning everyone now. <laughs> it is a pretty big sandwich. Mmm. I'm taking this home. This. Wow. You guys are all like crazy magicians. Like something weird is going on here. Whoa. That's breakfast. Yeah. In true me fashion, we need to take a selfie. So. Yes. If you don't mind, yeah, we're going to get in here. All right, say meaty. Meaty. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Yeah. This was so yeah. special, no, truly. Thank you. I don't know if I can go on. My love for mushrooms has been cemented. From a delicious side dish to a show-stopping main, their culinary versatility is unparalleled. And that's what makes mushrooms truly magic. Good Monday morning. The battle over abortion rights intensifying this morning. 